you really don't want locals to know, right? You right. don't want locals to know anything that's going on because who the fuck knows? You don't know if these guys in five years, it could have been tight with the dudes, whatever. So like I said before, knock on the door and, um, you know, what before happened? they even answered my, the parent, I was like, we got a problem, you know? So we went, we went and did what we had to do. We got them, um, got them on the ground and, uh, the TV is just playing a loop of the planes crashing into the tower. So. What's cooking, everybody? I apologize for my voice right now. I have COVID and I feel like shit. So I'm going to keep this intro very, very short. This is part two of my sit down with Jim. As I had mentioned last week, he was here for about six and a half hours. So we had a very great wide ranging conversation. I will note, at this point, we've been going for a long time. So sometimes when I'm in here for a very long time with somebody, my voice will get a little soft, especially if we're drinking a little bit of whiskey. So there were a few times where I felt like I was a little low on the volume. But other than that, conversation was great. Most importantly, we got to a lot of the open-ended questions that fans had from our first sit-down back in May. So I was very, very happy we got to address that. I think you guys will enjoy it. One note on that, though. When Jim is talking about the September 15th, 2001 raid, that was basically like the biggest open-ended question that existed from the May episode, you'll hear him say something along the lines of, they were there since 2005 or 2006. He meant to say 1995 or 1996. I just didn't want people confused. Other than that, though, I think we're good. If you're on YouTube, please subscribe. Please like the video. If you're on Apple or Spotify, thank you for checking out the show there. If you haven't already subscribed on Apple or followed on Spotify, make sure you do that. And that said, you know what it is. I'm Julian Dory, and this is Trend Fire. Let's go. This is one of the great questions in our culture. Where is the new Everyone understands this, but few seem to do it. If you don't like the status quo, start asking questions. There's, there's a side of a search warrant that wasn't scoped properly, right? So there, there was no access, or there was limited access to his computer, his network, his whatever, right? So that's one. That's part A, right? So separate that out. Secondly, there's usually even though even though you may decide to go to trial you may decide to roll the dice at trial you are always presented with some type of document not saying that it's a plea agreement or even a cooperation agreement but what it will give your attorney is the ability to see here's the guidelines and the guidelines come in you know they're they're kind of broad guidelines and they'll look at a couple different things they'll look at um, you know obviously if you had ownership there's point it's a point system so you'll come up, you know, uh, he's a guideline thirty-three with a, you know, with with a three criminal history, which he, means he was offered hey, this. He was, he was okay. offered what so you're talking about. Yeah. when when they do that, right? You'll see and you'll say, okay, uh, looks like you know my max is eighty-four months, my you know my minimum is seventy-two, right? So you're, but what I'm saying is your defense attorney will have this in hand. I believe I just want to state this yeah. for the record, yeah. and I'll check this. Yeah. It was at least twenty years what they offered him, which was so beyond the scope of what he did. But it can and I believe say, it was twenty five to life. So what it can say though is it, it can say something along the lines of this charge faces, you know, a maximum of twenty years. So it'll say two hundred and forty months right. in prison. Right. That if you look at any indictment, federal indictment, every single charge will have something associated with that. What I mean is there's actual a presentation to the defense attorney. Two things always happen, right? Nobody wants to try a case. Like, I'm just going to be honest, you know, like it's time, it's resources, and it's, it's time that you can't get to the next case. You know, it's like anything else. So I, you know, I'm going to waste, you know, it, it's, it's a waste. It's honestly a waste. A trial like that could be three months, four months. Plus the prep leading up to it, plus the witness prep, plus the travel, plus the expense. Plus, like I said, you take your best people. Cause clearly, you're putting your best prosecutor on that case because it's significant. Yes. So, you know, what they do is they'll present, let, let's just get rid of this. You know, so I would, I would love to know, like, I would love to look deeper into that to kind of understand two things. First off, what was the federal prosecutor doing that he wasn't up front with 
it sounds to me like first off, he, like I said, he's got he's got um, you know like fruits. What do they call it? Like uh, evidence or, or fruits of the poisonous tree is is what. Your typical mm-hmm. search warrant. Hey, you can't use that fruit because you fucked up the roots, you know, along the way in your investigation. So there's something in there with the scope of the warrant and the fact that they shouldn't have been looking or they should have had additional warrants in order to gain the information. Or there was some cooperator that provided information that they didn't run out. So they didn't identify the other people there that were utilizing. Right. So they didn't identify. They stopped. They stopped, you know, to, to close it all out. So that's one. By the way. And I want to note this just so you have this information. Yeah. One, I think there were multiple. The main cooperator they had was a key figure early on in Silk Road, like online on the chat rooms. Always. Who, the way that they set it up, the way that they got the Bo- Dread Pirate Roberts to order a hit. Yeah. And again, this is where I believe it was not Ross doing yeah. it. They had that guy turned him and then used him as a rat. And he was goading the other guys into doing it. They did it. And then what the agents did, and I'll put the picture in the corner. I've put it in here before. They put they put like they put like a can of old tuna fish or some shit like on his mouth and a couple other things to make it look like he had died by drowning in a bathtub in a hotel room. And they sent the picture as proof and DPR, Dread Pirate Roberts, said confirmed. Great, thank you. That's and so even with that evidence, and so this guy, the same guy who whether or not Ross ordered the hit, by the way, he was not in good graces with Ross when this happened. We know that. So like if Ross was incentivized, he would have been incentivized if he was gonna do that, he was right. incentivized to do it. Right. This same guy sits next to Ross's mom and does shows like this and says it was not Ross. I'm sitting on the fucking show telling you with a picture of my quote unquote dead body that he thought quote unquote was me, and I'm telling you, I'm sitting next to the guy's mom. It wasn't him. He mm. didn't do this. So it's, it's probably, it, you know, listen, it's probably an undercover, right? That's doing it. But, but my point is, there's a couple things that are that that don't make sense that I would like more information on. One, what was the scope of the warrant? Right? What were yeah. they supposed to have? What were they not supposed to have? What did they look at? What did they do? You know, what was the ruse? How did it work out? And then, secondly. Um, the other big part of it is what was the presentation to his defense attorney that went from, you know, X, whatever X was of the guideline, whatever he was offered in a plea agreement versus it, it doesn't matter. Like that never changes unless there's some egregious action that happens during the course of the trial where you're like, this fucking guy, oh my God, you know, he did this. Then they would stop the trial and, and what they, you know, basically issue another indictment a superseding indictment would they absolutely the good ones would everybody should well here's and here's everybody another should. here's another thing where i'll defend them yeah and without any evidence whatsoever by the way i'll give them a benefit of the doubt putting on my little tinfoil hat right now to me the way this case went down the federal prosecutor even the judge they had nothing to do with it they were pawns on the on the board i think this was a clear message i think this was i don't know from who but i think this was from high up in government because this kid beat the system what he did was he it was incredible what he did and what he created and by the way and i say this again cannot break international law just because you have a point doesn't work that way but he took drugs out of the hands of all the people who we armed in the 1980s by the way who've been pushing all this shit into this country and are now pushing in this shit that comes from China that includes fentanyl in it on the black market. And this is where, like, I I don't want to see people on drugs. I I get very, very... When we start talking about legalize everything, I start... I'm all about legalized weed. That one's common. But when we talk about for everything, I'm like, ah, there's a lot of downside to that. I'm not one of these guys who's like, let's just do it. But there is an element of, like, we let this keep happening. All right, you put El Chapo in prison. Congratulations. Pat yourself on the back. There's fucking three guys hanging from the from the city trees the next day from the next guy who's in charge, setting an example for some people who just looked at him the wrong way. Right. And then they're putting all these drugs into the country, and it continues to happen because, by the way, they own politicians down there. They own politicians here. Money. You say follow the money. 
I follow the money and I look at like I don't have a good answer for you. I'm sitting here telling you I, like I'm not ready to come out and say I'm open to the conversation, but I'm not ready to be like, let's legalize it all. But I am saying he did broke the law, had to go to jail. He did prove a point with this. There were people around the world who got access to fucking drugs in the mail that otherwise and not to by the way i won't even give him this credit not to say it always came from the best source i'm sure there were look it was a black market he had no control but the good if the good is defined as taking drugs and sales out of the hands of the cartels and hamas and shit like that versus the bad of, okay, we got some bad actors in there. We have some people putting fentanyl lace products in there. Some bad shit. The good did outweigh the bad. And so my utopitarian view is that go to prison. And if the government actually wants some things, start the conversation out of it. And when he gets out of jail and has served his time, have him be, don't have him spearhead it. Don't act like this is the second coming of Nelson Mandela. But have him be a part of the conversation. Make him a part of the solution instead of just a definition of a problem to say you got a notch on the belt. Well, they never even got that far. No. You know? So, I mean, I think, I think the, the what, what's not making sense to me is, is the whole, um, the process just seems warped. Yes. You know, I've never experienced that. I'm not saying that it hasn't happened before or since, but I never experienced that piece. You know, I, I was methodical about being in close contact, I, even if the federal prosecutors decided to let it off for a month, I was in close, I was always trying to negotiate a plea or, or trying to, to get cooperation in, on a daily basis. You know, I was calling my guys like they were an insurance claim. You know, I mean, hey, man. What was your you incentive know? for that? Well, I mean, I just think that the more of a wide, my incentive was I understood a wide, diverse intel um group you know uh, the more intel i had the more availability i had to other law enforcement to my to my um and not for my own good but for instance just take a simple kidnapping let's say a kidnapping piece right um if i had taken the time let's say i didn't let's say i was a one third or that just had a source because you were required to have at least one you know, back in the old days, guys would just go to the cemetery and pull a fucking name, put it in. It's my source. He's been dead for, you know, nobody checked. Right. Right. So my incentive was always let me establish as many sources as I can because there's going to come a point where the office or law enforcement in general or the FBI in general or Interpol or whatever is going to say, man, we were stumped by this. And I'm going to be able to reach out to my, you know, 30 40 50 sources and say hey what do we know and there wasn't a there wasn't a time that i wouldn't get 10 or 15 credible responses so that was always my incentive to continue to work cases okay all right that's right. actually a great answer so can i, I mean, take can i ask a clarification of then yeah because that that's important i i wasn't even expecting that and i should have been so sources, obviously. It's a and, network like anything else. And you, and we talked about that last time extensively. You understood that and you understand, you know, like pre 9-11 where that wasn't the FBI's job and that actually hurt the, rela and not that that makes it right, it hurts the relationship with the CIA because- For sure. On information. Okay. Outside of that, once, let's say sources, whatever the case is, sources are irrelevant to an extent and you are- you have a guy dead to rights. Are you just doing that so you can get the result done on paper, guaranteed in case he gets some crazy defense attorney like Gotti's first defense attorneys who got him off and it's done and it saves taxpayer money because you're not going to trial and doing the whole drag out thing? Is that part of it? Okay. You know, part of it is that. Part of it is the quicker I can get you pled out, the more. The quicker I can kind of nurture you as a source. So you're always thinking about that. Yeah, that's the key. Intel's the key, right? So it's been the key to my life since the army. You know, as as civil affairs guy, that's what you're doing. Hearts and minds, right? So I never got away from that. So, 
you know, my point is a source is always a source. It's always a source. It doesn't matter where he is, what, what he's doing. You know, because again, I've had, I have examples in my life of things that have happened. And the only reason they were success and they saved, you know, families heartache or they saved money or they saved people from getting hurt is because I had a source base that was different. You know, so I think in this in this instance, what it sounds like to me is, you know, if if it were me working this case and it were me that was in front of the defense attorney and the guy himself, you know, my thought first is always listen, if I'm talking to you, you've you fucking did something. Sure. Like I'm being honest. Like if if I'm I talk to everybody around you before I talk to you, but once I come to you, we got a problem. You know, you're and, in. and again, I've said this for like four times, but yeah. I want to be clear on this. Yeah. Again, no questions asked, criminal. Yeah, and I and I agreed, but but that yeah. gives me more of an opportunity because. Guys, I think only one of the good things to come out of COVID is the fact that I have successfully been able to sleep throughout this week and, and being sick and everything. I mean, obviously, when you get COVID, when you get the flu, anything that involves like a fever, chills, stuff like that, they tell you to sleep it off. You got to lay in bed and, and just try to get rest and get fluids and things like that. But it's easier said than done because, you know, you have the chills, you have muscle aches and stuff, you're tossing and turning. It's very, very difficult to get a deep sleep. Not with an eight sleep, though. Because I just woke up maybe, I don't know, a half hour ago, like 11.30, and I went to bed at 9.45 last night, and I don't think I got up in the middle of the night even once. You want to talk about a deep sleep in the middle of having COVID, no less. That's pretty incredible. And it is all because of my 8 Sleep Pod Pro cover. So if you use the link in my description, along with the code TRENDIFIER at checkout, that's T-R-E-N-D-I-F-I-E-R, you will get $100 off your own 8 Sleep Pod Pro cover. And as I tell you every week, it is an absolute game changer, so much so that it will actually help you get a deep sleep when you have COVID, no less. Now I'm, now I'm a test dummy for that and i can tell you it works very very well so use that link in my description along with the code trend to fire check out and get yours today i now know i've done my homework and, and maybe the agents did a good job up to that point you know improving with it the, and then what happens is you immediately flip switches i used to say this is the worst day the day i arrest you or the day you're indicted is your worst day because now it's not even your worst day it's your worst half day because the second half of that day and from then on you're team america you're going to help me mm. with other things. And if you, you're crazy if you tell me that you're not because you're going to be alone and you're eventually you're going to come and you're going to talk, even if it's a two-year sentence. It doesn't matter. If it's 24 months in jail, it sucks. Where, where I'll defend your position here, yeah. not your position, uh, excuse me, I'll defend the FBI's position potentially here, and I don't know this for sure, is that I don't know how much of a shot you would have had with that with Ross because when I say Ross was a radical, purebred libertarian, he was literally that. Like he yeah. was like all government's bad. I get it, right? But, but eventually, even even that guy, I'm gonna find a way. Mm. I'm gonna appeal to some part of that head. That's what I get paid to do. You know, I'm gonna appeal to some part of that head that he says, "Shit, I kind of even if it's I like that guy. He's funny." Mm. And eventually, we're you know could take longer and could take longer, but it could take you never know. But always, you know, always what I'm saying is I would have been in there at least entertaining that and and offering an out for him, like offering it. I I like told you I've said to people, bad people that I don't have any, you know, <laughs> love for in any way. I've said to them. Bro, you're fucking crazy for going to trial. Like, you're going to get convicted. And once that happens, my hands are tied. Once it gets in front of a judge, I there's not a lot I can do. I, I'll fully admit that what I'm about to ask, I don't know if you would say on camera, this, yeah. might, this might be an untouchable territory. And if people don't like that, fuck them. They'll have to deal with it. They're, you say enough that I think people should trust your credibility and, and appreciate what you put out there. My scenario to that, would be okay what you just said i accept and those two possibilities fine i'm sure they happened all the time what about the scenarios and how true are these how often do they happen where you have a higher up come down and say fuck what you think 
we're making a political statement for X, Y, and Z, you are not permitted to do K, J, or I. I, I can honestly look you in the eye and say it never happened to me. Now, I also never put myself in a position where that could have. I knew more about anything those guys could ever, you know, opine to. Mm. I, I just, so, you know, you come down and you could, I, I honestly can't remember ever even having that conversation, but if they did, I they knew they were going to get just embarrassed in front of whoever they did it in front of. Mm. You know, so now does that happen? Yeah, I'm sure it fucking happens. You know, okay. I mean, I'm sure it happens, and and it, a lot of things happen in the bureau from higher ups. Did you ever have buddies you know? come to you about that kind of thing? I mean, I'm trying to think. You know, not not that particular type of situation. Hey, we're gonna we're gonna charge this because you know we have to we have to get something on the books. Um, I would say the closest to that that you would see is. During times when a field office, and you know, there's 56 field offices plus the international kind of uh, presence. And if a if an office was struggling per se, like okay, you know, these the inspect like here, when I say I want Jim Yacone to be the director and be the face, what I mean about the inspector general or, or that is is to straighten out this inspection process because it's ass backwards. Mm. They're missing out on shit that they need to to address and one of the things was let's not create a case because we don't have one in that particular area mm. let's not create a healthcare case just because the inspectors are coming in so they say that without a doubt yeah i mean that happens right so now that case may be dormant i like that it might be dormant it might not it just might be hey we we have allegations that this healthcare you know facility is doing is billing double billing for testing for diagnostic? Okay, I can hold on to that and just say, oh yeah, oh do I have a double billing? Oh, of course I do. Yeah, but might not ever do it. Or could it be more sinister than that? Maybe you know. I never experienced it. I never let it happen. You know, I would get to the bottom of it. If I was doing an inspection, I'd be like, hey man, you're full of shit. <laughs> you know, this is not whatever, right? So, but that doesn't mean that other offices. And I have seen examples so so take the casework right that's one part of it where you're kind of like i haven't really seen in spite of just laziness i haven't really seen like somebody's oh let's let's fucking do this what i have seen is is you know the lack of due diligence you know Mm. um not lies per se but lies because there's dereliction of their duties, you know, they just haven't. Uh, oh yeah, I did thirty checks on that fucking dossier. No, you didn't. Yeah, okay, you didn't, right? Or, man, what's becoming a big problem in the bureau is the sexual harassment shit. You know, I mean, I'm telling you, like, I see stuff that is just fucking dis- like just awful to friends of mine that have reached out to me in my retirement. That friends that I love, like, you know female agents that I love and that just have nowhere to turn. Nobody believes them. Nobody believes them. So, so I, what does that say about the character of an organization? What does that say about the need to have someone go in there and clean house? Like it's time, man. It's no longer a good old boys club. It shouldn't be that way. There's too many talented people of all, you know, of, of all types that can do the job. I, I'll leave the one thirders alone, honestly, because you know what? I don't fuck. They're not going to do anything anyway. They're not changing. What right. am I going to do? All right, so I'm going to make you take your crossword puzzle and go to Dunkin' Donuts instead right. of sitting there. Fuck right. it. Who cares? You know, if as long as they're there when we do a search warrant and they carry the boxes out, I'm good. Well, I don't care where it's from, whether it's the FBI or some corporation. Nothing makes me sadder than people who are a victim of the taking advantage. Of the awareness because of the they situation. Can. Yes. So like there are a lot of that's a very real thing. When and you know, it can be both sexes, but particularly with women in the workplace where that happens. It and, does. and it's it's more common than I'm comfortable with by far not that I'm comfortable with any level, but it's like it happens much more than a cynic would think. I agree. And immediately you and I both know 
that the victim is looked upon as if they're fucking crazy. And here's the problem. Here's they're the problem. Crazy. You know? One of the biggest things that hurt this was the quote unquote Me Too movement. And I'm not categorically ripping everyone who played into that. If anything, there was some awareness that, that came of that that I appreciate for those people, if not for the fact that a lot of people used it as an opportunity to take attention. So I can say out of the same mouth that like a Harvey Weinstein who's case started that thing that was a disgusting guy i don't care how many women came out like a hundred yeah yeah Wh just whatever boat it was. Loads. i'll even play this card if there were 10 who were full of shit i i care but i don't care because yeah. i'm like there are fucking 90 who weren't and right. this is like the worst of the worst right fine a lot of other things also happened after him where whether it was people in power or people who had power that people didn't know but they were rich whatever where people got exposed great Love that. Like anything else, though, we don't have an ability to be 50 miles an hour. We don't have an ability to do anything besides zero or 100. And we went 100 with it. And so you had a lot of people, grifters, who took advantage of this and boy slash girl, depending on the situation, who cried wolfed it and broke some people on it. I know my dad actually did a case where he was – before he took it, he did due diligence on it because he was like, I, I, I need to – like my, my, you know my dad very well. My dad, one of the things that probably hurts him as a lawyer is I don't think he's ever defended a guilty guy. Like, mm. And he's not in defense. He's, in, mm. he's on the civil side. Yeah. But as far as like someone who's like in the wrong, yeah. like he, he won't do it. Like mm -hmm. his clients are his brothers and yep. his sisters. Like yep. that's how he is. Before he took this, he needed to like look through it. And it was a case where a guy got, quote unquote, me tooed, right? He was innocent as fuck. And he, they cleaned out the other side in court. And I was so happy to see that happen yeah. because you don't see enough yeah, of that. You don't. My issue with the whole thing is that we saw a lot of people on that cry wolf side who now, and I see it all the time, it's created an environment of people just being like, oh God, yeah, I'm sure they did, whatever. It's sad. Because now what it does is the people that it happens to, and it does. Now, what it, you, it was your own words. You said it. You know how it is. People are less likely to believe them. They're like, okay, yeah, whatever. Well, that's sick to me. You know, and my intention, it, my, my first gut is to believe you. Yep. Like, it's a very personal thing. Yep. And the fact that I have in the back of my mind that, okay, well, let's check this out. That's sad that I got to think that. It is. You know, it's, it's kind of like we've become... Those kinds of movements, which are important because I think they do, you know, they definitely raise situational awareness in a lot of different ways. But we are cynical towards, um, come on, you know, it's a money grab, right? And yep. it's really not. Like, it's really not. Sometimes it really is a true, like, distraction at, at best and devastation at its worst, you know, like – Listen, it's the bureau is still a good old boys network. I mean, I'm just telling you it is. And um I think I've said this. I don't know if I've said this, but you know, I managed a lot of agents, like a lot of agents. And my top 5, four of the five are women. Wow. In the way you they never worked. said that. In the way they worked. Who? I mean, it was just, you know, one who's getting harassed right now in an office, you know, that oh, I'm so, trying so to help out. Don't say and, that. Yeah. And then, you know, another one, they're all active. They're all still active. But um, is one of them the person, I'm just curious on this. She was young when she did this, which made it impressive. But she led the post 9 11 investigation at the FBI. I can't remember her name. No. I'll pull it up while you're talking. Yeah. No. I, I, I no, it was. Uh, no. Okay. Continue. Um, yeah. but I think that many times we're, you know, kind of, um, paralyzed to the thought of it being a truthful allegation. Right. Um, and you know, we've seen it time and time again, we've seen public figures kind of walk away from it, you know, and nothing happened. And, uh, I mean, look at even right. Like I think. Didn't Cosby get released from jail? I mean, 
You know what I mean? Um, and then this this latest clown, you know, uh, our, hey, our our, uh, our guy got him off the first time. I know. Yeah, and you know he he's and then a refused to, he's to a take lawyer. him the second time. He'd yeah. sit in here as a good lawyer and say, "I hey. cannot discuss my client. He was innocent. Whatever." Yeah. But he knows. He he left the case after that, that and then he got convicted. That tells you everything. Tells you, you everything. Know? So, yeah. but I mean, it's um, it, it's kind of it's it's sad. You know, it, it's sad that we've come to the point where women still have to defend the fact that they just want to be treated like everybody else. And I, and I sound like a, a, a goddamn, you know, like, you know, I, I, I probably should do some push-ups or something. But, um, <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like, it's just, and it's it's become personal for me. And I think of the fact if if somebody did that to my daughter, we wouldn't have to worry about a lawsuit or we wouldn't have to worry about, yeah. you know, crime or, or, or a conviction because I know how I take care of it. Period. Just got to draw them off out of the States. Just <laughs> I tell people, I've only told two people in my life, don't ever travel outside the United States. Oh. Mm. You'll never come home. Nice. Only two, though. And they know who they are. It's not that many. And remember, I'm reminding you again, do not travel outside the United States. Or actually, one guy, you know who you are. Definitely take a trip. Mm. <laughs> you, you make me, like, I believe you when, when, yeah, when I hear that kind of stuff. Yeah, I'm serious about that. They, I know. They're hurtful dudes. And they need to go. And you're, you're in an interesting position with that kind of thing because, you know, there's like the law. There's the way we execute it. There's the right to fair trial. There's all that shit. But there's a human anger. Like, it, you remember that? What was the case? That, You're treat, they're, they're animals, these two people. Yes. They're animals. They're, they're, they're animals. You remember the Larry Nasser case? Yeah. The gymnastics? The gymnast yeah, doctor. Yeah. And, Do you remember the father? Yeah. In court? Abso who uh, lunged for absolutely. the guy? Absolutely. And he didn't, and, and I and actually. The, the guys, they, they subdued him, but they didn't want to, and they. They were treating them like a million bucks. And they didn't charge them. Nope. And they shouldn't and, charge and them. And I appreciated that. Yep. 100%. Because you have to, again, it comes back to that intent thing you keep talking about. 100%. You have to put yourself in that position. The bailiff's job is to make sure, all right, he doesn't get there. Yep. There was 10 of them there. He didn't get close. He didn't get close. Right. And I don't know that he knew that that was going to be the case. No. But like, imagine being the father in that. And I I, can't. I'll, I'll put that clip in the corner I, so people can I see can't. what I'm talking about. But I can't imagine. Yeah. I can't imagine. You know, and, and, and you have a daughter too. Exactly. I can't imagine. And, you know, I think about um, times that I've had that, you know, I've witnessed things that have happened to, to parents and, and um, you know, I don't know how they, I don't know how they get through it, you know. what know What's that conversation do, so. like? Like when you have to deal with one of those where you have to inform next of kin, not about a dead person. I'm sure that one's brutal too. But like about, hey, this happened. Like a, we're, like we're, a victim, you know, yeah. a victim witness type thing, you yeah. know, where you're kind of like, it's hard to do it because, you know, you, you're you're basically interviewing parents at first. And, you know, I am, I consider myself a, a really pensive interviewer. I think about everything like we talked about. You know, I think about when, when I think about a prosecutor I was bringing a case to or a judge we were going to be in front of, I, I do more work on their background than I do on, you know, anybody else's, right? Because I want to understand their thought process. And it's the same thing with parents. You know, you spend some time thinking about the reaction, you know, how they're going to be, like, what can I tell? You know, there there's different ways I've approached different people. And, and that's that goes back to my military days as a, as a casualty assistance officer, when you're basically going to, you're walking with the chaplain in order to tell people in the middle of the night that their son or daughter is passed, is killed in combat, or or you're actually escorting somebody from it, mm -hmm. and, and you're spending time. And I still have two families that I that I regularly talk to. That I did that. And I was with their kids when they died, and so in combat, yeah. And so they are, you know, they you, become you family. They have become family. You're close with them, like very that? close, you know, and they become family and. It's comforting, and my wife has taught me through her loss and through her loss and grief center that, you know, it is so important. I can remember the first time I, 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 
I never knew that up until I would say six or seven years ago, how to do it or not even how to do it, but, but how you should act. So you're, you're always very tentative about it, right? You, you want to treat it like you feel like you, you're, you're honoring, but you're, it's hard to treat it. You're treating it as a fucking disaster when you really shouldn't do that. You know? Wait, what do you mean? I so, so you're thought. going into it with this pen, like, oh, you know, oh, he's dead. You know what I mean? Like it's, but what my wife taught me that I, the first time I, I did it, it was it was so natural that it was crazy. And I was like, why didn't I have this woman before to explain this? And I was at a function in Chicago, and it was a um, – similar to the Johnny Mac. It's an organization um, – Just a reminder, that's your foundation that you're on. The Johnny Mac, that we yeah. talked about. Okay. This one is uh, – it's based out of Vegas. Um, the Folded Flag – and it's it's run by a guy. It's started by a guy. I think he's class of sixty seven from West Point. His name is Bill Foley, and Foley is a, a very 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 successful businessman. Um, Foley um, probably one of two um, multi billionaires alumni, mm. and Foley owns the Golden Knights, so he owns the Vegas hockey team. And so he started this foundation doing very similar work to what we've been doing. Yeah, and I have it behind us. I'm you got it, right? It. Full the flag. Provides educational scholarships and supports grants to the spouses and children of the U.S. military yep. and government personnel who die as a result of hostile action or an accident related to U.S. Exactly. Combat. So you guys are specifically focusing the on kids college. And the kids. And he's taken he's, the spouses under his wing, which is wonderful. So we work together and- and Bill's in a, he he's a very um, unique guy. He, he's a difficult guy to get to know. Like I, I imagine most billionaires are, right? So um, anyway, I'm at a function in Chicago, and I decide to go out and kind of be a liaison between their organization and Johnny Mac. And I did it on my own dime. And we get out there, and there's you know they have a speaker that night, and it's a man who lost his son in combat, and uh, he gets up and he it's a it's a a beautiful story, like you know about. His service and he always knew and at the end of that thing you know everybody kind of just dis dispersed and grabbed the drink and stayed away from him you know and i thought to myself man sheila she told me what you know to do something so i walked over i shook his hand and i said hey man what what sports did did i forget the kid's name i i, I feel bad but what sports did bill play in mm. in high school and he turned around and he was like and he just had like this smile and he said well, he's a great baseball player, you know, and we started talking and what did you, oh man, like, tell me a story about when he was in school. Did he get in trouble? And, and just treated him like he was there. The kid was there cause he is there. It's never going away for this guy. And it was powerful for me. I was like, shit, that is a simple thing that we just forget. Cause we don't, you know, I don't, I don't want to go to that cause I don't know what to say. You know what? Ask him what the fuck his name was. You know, and, and my wife has taught me that. So I've, I'm, I'm, I feel comfortable around that now, which is, you know, I hate it, but I feel really comfortable saying like, Hey man, you know, um, but another story I have to, to think about like helping people, right. And, and not feeling bad for yourself, but similar line on that piece. Like, um, I had a really good buddy. Uh, I shouldn't even say that he's a really good buddy now, but he's a, it's a couple in my town whose who's young son, whose 16-year-old son, um, four years ago, um, wind up um, dying by suicide. And, um, man, at, at first I was like, I don't know, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not going there, you know. And what happened was slowly in the town, people just, they didn't want to be around it. So they stayed away. And Sheila, of course, my, my my angel of a wife, you know, befriends. She knew them kind of, but she befriends these people and they become friends. And now, like, they're amazing people. And they, they their spirit, you could feel it around. And I've played golf with this guy a bunch of times. And you could see at his club, everybody stays away. And mm -hmm. so he's like, you know what, Jim? You're the only dude that still wants to play golf with me. And I said, Pete, I'll do it forever. I'll play golf with you for every single day, whatever. And I told him a story about having some discussions with family members about, you know, life is tough and, hey, you got to watch, you know, and, and that his strength and, and his son, whose name's Pierce Jark, um, 
Oh, I never knew, but I feel like I did. I, it's always that way for me. But um, you're so good at that it, too. It just, you're but so, it comes you know, natural, you know, because so of Sheila. At, you're so good at, and and you. And that's it's awesome. Just that because you of Sheila. I mean, she's so. I said to him, if it wasn't for Pierce, I might not have had some tough discussions with young people that were struggling. Mm. I don't feel uncomfortable saying, you're going to kill yourself? And sometimes they'll say, yeah, what's your plan, bro? Well, I don't have a plan. Well, that makes me happy because you're not serious about it. You know, but... What happens when they say and they, they, they light they up? It. They light up. What They're happens like, when they admit it? Though? They just feel better. Like nobody ever asked no, me that. that they, when they admit that they have a plan, yeah, I've thought about it. Uh, plan's a problem. You got to get help. How do you deal with it? You got to get help. You got to get them to the right spot. You got to get them at a level of you know higher level of care than Jim Diorio. You know, have people admitted that to you. I've never had somebody have a plan, so I'm, I'm happy. But I, but I, you know, how many people shy away from not asking the question because you don't want to hear? Because you know, the, the old adage is, well, if I ask them, they're gonna, it's gonna encourage them to do it. Bullshit. Do you think some of them are lying? But your recognition of the fact that you see them and the fact that you call them on that it. you ask them the question and and show concern shows that maybe people in the world have concern for them and suddenly totally see meaning. In life? I think that's a hundred percent accurate. I think when you actually call them on it, it's a question. Listen, you know, I think we've all had thoughts of. Maybe, you know, maybe this isn't going the way. And not, not to the level of some of these kids. And this is a tough time. Like, it's a tough time. I see kids all over the place that are suffering. They're just suffering. They're anxious. Yeah. They're, they're suffering from panic attacks. They, they, they are being diagnosed with stuff that maybe they don't even know what the hell it means. And, and they're trying to deal. And, and it's a competitive world, you know, yes. now. And so I, I think it's, yeah, I think yeah. It, it really, and I think it's just, it's okay. Like when I, when I said to that, like, I was scared to go up to that guy and say, Hey, what, what do you like to do? Like, what, what sport did he play? I was like, what if this guy says like, shut the fuck up, you know what I mean? Like, like, what if he just thinks I'm an idiot for being so, um, you know, just forward about it. But then I put myself in his shoes and I said to myself, what if it was me? Would I want everybody to stop talking about my son? No. Because he passed? No. I might even feel like- as What a, the fuck? As like, a, yeah. As a parent, and I've never been a parent, so I can't truly imagine this, but I can try to understand it. I might even be just questioning if I had done anything differently in a way that I would think, and it might be different for a lot of people. I'm not saying this is how you have to deal with it, but a way I might like to- not like, but a good way for me to face that and put that out in the open and be able to not move on with my life. You never move on, but be able to live Yeah, is the ability to talk about it and talk about the good and understand that like very bad shit happens in the world. And I, I, I think that as a parent, that's probably the worst of the worst yeah. when your kid's in that position and you know, he, he or she didn't feel like they could ask for help but right to have someone in here especially from your generation you know you're not a millennial <laughs> no luckily Thank God. <laughs> sorry not the not the rip my own people like but like you know you're from and you're a military guy you're a pick myself up i'm gonna take care of my shit kind of guy and yet you have all these nuanced views on stuff and like i'm gonna clip the fuck out of what you just said i'm sure i'll have to go back and look at it to make sure it's possible and it's right but it sounded right to me when when you said that because i want people to hear that there are people like you who think that way and like not for nothing some of the stuff like i talked with you earlier when you brought up the cj morgan thing maybe on the last podcast because we're on part two by now but there are some sacred things that happen in here that don't come out of my mouth and they come out of the mouth across from me from all different types of people. And a couple that come to mind right now on this subject would be Grant Wiley, my friend who was one of the best college linebackers ever at West Virginia. Amazing guy, by the way. And then another amazing dude, Ashton Larold, who's had and is unbelievably open about it, has had all kinds of mental health mm. struggles since a young age. Right? There were things that he got into when he was like 10 years old. By the way, not from bad parenting. His parents are great. It's just kind of life and like people he was around where you know, he, he got in front of drugs and, and, and alcohol before he could jerk off. I mean, let's call it what it is. 
and some of the things he then dealt with from that to see like some of the stuff Grant shared in here and then what Ashton shared where they put it as guys too, which is also, you know, that's more of a taboo thing. They I'm put it down. out in the open. They talk about it. I mean, like Ashton talked about the note. He talked about the, the it was a time period where it was like every day, like, oh, which way am I going to go? Man. And we put out one clip of that. Yeah, it was great. And, you know, I want to see how I want to say this, but it, it went viral. Yeah. And the the number of people who were touched by that on one hand for our society as a whole was concerning for me mm -hmm. because it was so many. And on the other hand, because of part A right there, the part B of the fact that they saw this and saw, I mean, he's a wordsmith, he's a musician, mm -hmm. brilliant writer. Mm -hmm. Like his, that, I could listen to that guy read the phone book and like remake it in I his own you. words. It's yeah. incredible. The way he described this feeling starts it off i didn't want to die but i didn't want to be alive and then gives a visual and explains like eventually i got to a point where i realized anxiety depression post-traumatic stress all the shit i dealt with and deal with okay you're all still there but we're all in a car and i'm driving and i'm in control of this motherfucker the part b of people seeing that who are in that position to realize oh my god this guy's not denying that existence no but he lives on and has lived on through this years later and lives a lives a very good life right like like he, I, I like that guy a lot I, I i really love him great dude yeah you know and puts his name behind things puts his opinions out there makes music does all these different things and it's like well he made it through and he did it without saying oh it doesn't exist i'll just toughen myself up he did it by saying no you exist but yep. i'm gonna own you yep and the idea that like okay there's more people than i'm comfortable with who felt that but i can't change that that already happened they already feel that way the idea that a 29 second clip of this dude sharing that in here on camera on a microphone can be played over and over and over again i mean this thing has like 78 79,000 shares like shares Unbelievable. views it's at like 10 million that is a beautiful thing and like we talk about the impact with like a cj morgan clip yeah i don't really control that i'm the vessel to put it out once people say it but goddamn, am I appreciative of it because they give me the opportunity to to do that. Absolutely. And so from another angle, completely other angle, I might add, when I hear you describe this situation that way, I appreciate that a lot because there are a ton of kids who are growing up in this time too. I mean, it's a it's, it's, tough. it's a fucked up time. It's tough. It's a fucked up time. Yep. Who maybe not even the fault of their parents or no. whatever. No, I can they see that. They just don't feel seen with this and you know how it is actually you can understand this with and i appreciate you bring this up a few minutes ago because i know i i don't go here because i don't want to bring up stuff that you don't want to go to no, but like your own ptsd yeah from the battlefield and just in general man you yeah. know just things you see you can't unsee but you know i think that i think the importance here is if You've got to, you've got to fake it till you make it, you know? And, and I remember thinking about, there were a couple days where I woke up in the morning and I'm thinking to myself, why the fuck am I saying like my life sucks? Like mm. what is going on? But you recognize the ability to, to work it out, work through it, right? It's the, it's the people that let that go, which I'm not saying, I, listen, it's not, it's not the end of the world when you do that, but it shouldn't be that way. Everybody, there's value, you know, in everybody and everything they do. And, you know, even, like I said, even the guys, the worst guys that I ever met, there's value. There's something I learned from them, you know, about life or about what situations do to you or how to be more situationally aware or how to be more cognizant. Look at the, look at the guy I was talking about that said you're placed in the, the path for, for a reason. You know, you're placed in the path of this kid for a reason. That's a bad, he was a bad dude. Like he was not a good guy. He'll tell you that. Right. So I think it's like, it's just, it's just the realization of being comfortable enough with yourself that you can, you can be comfortable with others that makes mm. sense you know to be able to and it's all we always we all fight that negative core belief that we're not good enough i'm I, I will go to my deathbed saying that 
you know, and it's, it's what drives us. But at the same time, you got to be careful because it'll, it'll knock you down, sure. you know, it'll knock your ass down. And we all have, we all have the ability and value is not in dollars and cents. It's not in the nicest car and the nicest clothes and the nicest college and no student loans and, you know, this great job value is in your impact. It's mm. in your impact on others, period. I mean, it is time and time again, the best people we know, the best people we know, we all have two, three, four people that we know are people that made an impact on our lives or the lives of others. Not the money. I, I never say, oh, you know, that guy was a good guy. Like my coach I talked about today. Like, you know, my 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 little league coach, the guy made an impact. I thought of shit. I thought of stuff that he said to me at every stage of my life in difficult times. Every stage. You know? Just just the just the why didn't you throw a curveball? Like, you know, because I don't know how to. Well, you know what? It taught me like, hey, why didn't you why didn't you do this in a situation, you know? Well, you know what? Maybe I better learn how to do that because I'm going to need to throw a curveball at some point, you know? And Mr. Papa helped me to do that. So I think that's that's the beauty of what we're doing um, in life. Like, that's the beauty of of being able to just talk about mistakes and talk about things we did and incorporate some humor into it, incorporate some, you know, some true feeling. And, and being, you know, I'm open. Like, you you see it. Like, my, my parents did a good job. Like, they raised me to... to even in a even in a place that didn't really reward you know outside the box thinking um I learned how to do it you know and and my classmates at West Point will tell you like and I forget some of this stuff you know but they'll tell me like hey man I remember one time like we were all sucking wind and you just did an imitation of the the company tack officer and it just brightened everybody's night you know and and I was like well that there's my there's my value that was my value, and I learned to take that and and utilize it in ways to get people to to cooperate or, or people to talk or tell me. That that's a perfect spot to leave it, man. Like I I want to leave that conversation right there. I'm sure I'll clip that up and put that out there just to live on like YouTube, like forget TikTok even. But I, I just I, I really and I say this and I'll say this every time people kind of share that here behind the the blinds there on this I, I i really really appreciate you sharing that and and putting that out there and, and giving people an opportunity to see the other side of it from a tough guy right you're 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 the dream tough guy you're you're hank schrader man you're hank schrader except you're fbi <laughs> go on you love ray that. donovan you yeah, yeah without the killing you're more a ray donovan but i'm saying you look like hank schrader hank He's a good man. There were a lot of TikTok comments going, oh, Hank, Hank Schrader rolling in. I love it. You're like a big TikToker now, too. <sighs> Huge TikTok guy. I couldn't even spell it a year ago. Yeah, Dave Urban really converted you. Herbs. The Herbster. Herbs. He's a good man. Well, something less hilarious. We'd be yeah. remiss if we didn't really dig into this. And this is where, yes, obviously, I love your FBI background and the interrogation stuff and war on terror, things you were involved with, but especially military side. This is where that comes in from an expertise standpoint. But you and I talked back in mid-August when Afghanistan went down. And mm -hmm. I'm glad we waited. Because like even I think like the next the day after that happened, I was recording a podcast. And I always talk yeah. about this. I have shit age badly in here like a day later sometimes. Like we're just reacting to stuff. I was tempted to bring you in right away after yeah, that. I'm yeah. glad we let some dust settle. Yeah, me too. Some ability to see some things out for what they were and also now figure out where we go from here. And there's a lot of bone to pick off here. We could talk about this for a while. Let's do it. One thing though before that, because I really, really appreciated this and this is the thing that unfortunately goes unseen. Mm -hmm. You told me a story. I don't know if you remember this, but you definitely remember this happening because it was pretty serious where when Afghanistan fell, you happened to be, was it in North Carolina? Yeah. At the time? Yes. So you were with a we bunch of- We were flying of, back from, um, yeah, from, from a golf trip in Pinehurst. So you were with a bunch of your class of 86 buddies from West Point? Yeah. Among, uh, some 86 or some 91ers. Yeah. A, okay. a good, uh, like a solid group. Now, the way I understood this and correct the record, if I have any of these details wrong- 
was that I guess it was like the day after Afghanistan fell or a, a couple days couple, later. Maybe a, maybe a couple days. Yeah. Within 48 hours. Prior to what we now know was the horrific attack on the military where 13, I believe it was 13 U.S. service members That's died. That's right. It was prior to this. There was one basically unreported death that occurred post Afghanistan that we that we have since yeah that since has been confirmed but at the time we we really we weren't sure at the time and um we were all kind of you know kind of going our separate ways and and um Raleigh Durham it wasn't in Charlotte it was in Raleigh Durham I'm sorry and um the airport's the airport's kind of weird. It's a smaller. It's really nice, but it's a smaller airport, and boy, it takes it takes forever um, if you're flying, especially if you're flying JetBlue. For some reason, they don't come on time. Like JetBlue not being on time. Yeah, come but on. but I mean, just like their people to check you in, and so I had an early flight, but because I was there earlier than anybody else, and it took me just as long to as everybody else who was <laughs> flying other flights, like to check in and to get down into the terminal, all of a sudden we have, you know, obviously we have a group text. It's a group of, it's a group of um, probably 20 of us that are pretty tight. Um, it's a larger group than my normal six or seven person group daily, but uh, all West Point guys, all combat veterans. And we get a message from one of our buddies and he says, Hey, um, there's a, there's a, uh, a tarmac, ceremony which means we're we're used to it you know you might have been you might have been on an aircraft where the pilot will actually announce hey listen we have a hero um on board and you know most i know what that means immediately but most folks are kind of looking around like where's he sitting where's she sitting what that means is they're carrying the body of of a service of the deceased service wait member. like a regular yeah, a commercial regular, flight will yeah, have abs- that. Absolutely, and they'll have a they'll have a service member's body down below. Yeah, underneath. So they'll they'll carry it in the cargo, and they'll be escorted by. Um, th- there's a there's a great. If you ever want to really what? understand Wait, you, what. Yeah, that's normal, but that's normal. It doesn't come on the military plane. No, you know a lot of times when. That's w- fucked up. When milita- I'm sorry. No, nah, it's it's good. It's a good thing. Because you it, think so? Yeah, and I'll tell you why. Because I think it exposes. So many more of it educates. We mm. talk about educates. It educates people what the sacrifice is like because if it just flew on a military plane, we know what that's about. We do the we do the ramp ceremony when mm. they're leaving country. That's right? interesting. But we okay. do this. So so you, normally you're going to be FedEx or UPS into Delaware. We all know that. We laugh about it. What's that base called? So that's Dover. So Dover, it's where yeah. they prepare the bodies, right? And it's amazing. But if you ever want to see something that kind of shows you the process, there's a movie that's HBO did. Um, with Kevin Bacon, probably ten years ago, Love and it's Kevin called. It, it's awesome. It's called taking taking chance, and what it is is his. He is a he's a Marine Corps lieutenant colonel who never got the opportunity to serve in combat, so he asks for a mission um, to go and escort a body of a young private who was killed, and it's based on a true story, and it shows his kind of trip to this Wyoming small town. And how he carries the body, and 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 it's great. So so definitely, it's sad, but it's beautiful, and it tells exactly what we're talking about. So um, what happens is we get this text message that says, "Hey, this is this is happening," and we're all kind of scrambling because we're not familiar with the airport, but it's a small airport, and we kind of look down upon um, an aircraft coming in, and we we recognize it right away because there's service members and family that actually go out on the tarmac and and stand and this is a commercial aircraft it's a commercial airliner yeah so we kind of gather you know we find ourselves we had left and said goodbye and did our hugs and and you know be safe love you and all that stuff and we kind of gather again and we just stood outside just beyond the family and we kind of stood at the position of attention and we we salute it uh you know not not a regular suit, hand salute, but hand over the chest. Why, you why went this? out to the tarmac. We actually stood just just behind the family because we didn't want to go too far out. But this far is enough, Raleigh Durham Airport. Yeah, yeah. So they so, let you out on the yeah, tarmac. Yeah, they let us out. And How'd that happen? That might be me. You know, I might. So have you been said able to West Point. We're yeah, going. and I showed my my retired. We all showed our retired, you know, ID cards, and they just they wouldn't let us go all the way out to the family because you never know. You right. Know, you got to right. really be cautious and careful. And we kind of just stood there. 
and uh and watched and witnessed and um you know kind of um companion grief is what i call it just being being around people so so how, i, I want to understand how this yeah. works i'm trying to picture yeah. this commercial aircraft gets in whatever it is american airlines mm -hmm. u.s airways whatever pulls in does it pull in all the way to the booth no okay so it waits on the tarmac yeah. so that people are all still on the plane and down below the plane with the cargo is the family gathers the family gathers they, and there's a body they, that's presented they let the escort off the aircraft via mm. stairs um they ask the pilot makes an announcement and remember mo i'd say 90 percent of air airline pilots are retired or sure. were, were military so they understand and and it's amazing because if you think about flights think about any flight you've been on when the pilot says hey listen we've got people that are either catching connectors or we're not up Folks, don't take your seatbelts off yet. You know, we're not up to what happens. People are like, fuck that. You know, mm -hmm. get up and act like the obnoxious assholes that most people are. But in this instance, and I've seen it a couple times, I've actually been on aircraft. I've been an escort officer. And people, for some reason, just freeze. They stop and they tears in the eyes. And they some of them stand up and put their hand over their heart. It's pretty amazing. To, to witness and so like in the aircraft in the aircraft so you can see that yeah so we i know it because i've been in it but i know that's kind of what happens and then the body is is removed with a flag draping the casket you know they kind of take it out of a it's it's actually in a crate they take it out of the crate and they have a flag and they present the flag and um they don't present the flag but they put it over the casket and the family's there and they say their last goodbyes and you know kind of before the funeral home or wherever they're going or if they're capable of being open casket and and it's a very um ceremonious um you know it's a powerful piece you know it's a power there's only other one other thing that i can compare it to and that's um you know when you lose a soldier in your in your, in your unit and you actually have a, a ceremony immediately upon the body being returned and we usually cover the body and do what we have to do but we put his boots and his helmet and and their rifle up and you know you kind of it's 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 an it's incredibly powerful and then you have what's called a roll call and mm. basically your first sergeant who's your top nco your top nine commission officer kind of stands up and and he goes through the list of people and he you know um you know private first class dory you know present sir you know private, whatever uh, you know captain diorio present and then they get to the person's name and they yell the name the first time they just say it like you know um, you know, Colonel McHugh. Oh, yeah, and there's just this. silent, right? And then Colonel John McHugh. I've seen this. And then they go through it. And then as soon as that last yell, and it's a yell, it's like a, it's like a, um, almost like a, uh, a, a nerve, a, a panicked yell, uh, like, where are you kind of thing. And then as soon as that stops, taps, lights up, you know, so the bugle goes. And so it, it's a similar kind of feel, but yet without a lot of that, you know, and, and the family is just there and you're just, you're just in, you know, you're, you're companioning their grief. You're being around them. And, um, boy, I tell you, we, we kind of, before it ended, we kind of made our way back up and we're standing above overlooking the window onto the family. And as they, as they started to walk up, everybody, they just like kind of looked up and they had a smile on their face, you know, just we don't know who you guys are, but goddamn, that was fucking so you spectacular. Were, you yeah. were still inside. Just kind of stand it. And then we just, we as quick as, salute? nah, we don't, you know, just hand over the heart. And um, you're not in uniform. I don't salute. You know, I, I just don't believe it's something I want to do out of uniform. Why is but, that? And it's just, it's, it's, listen, I've seen, you know, I've seen a lot of the, the older, the Korean War guys, the Vietnam guys do it. And that's great. And I support it. But I just never, I always was trained and. And felt like if I was in uniform, I saluted. If I wasn't, I didn't. You know, I put my hand over my heart and stood at the position of attention, and um, you know, did that. Versus in, yeah, it's just my sense. Yeah. You know, I, I just and a lot of guys, a lot of my classmates believe that. And so then we just separated as quickly as we came, and you know, that was it. You know, we just went back, and and it's um, there. There's never a coincidence with my group. You know, there's something that always calls us back to hey. You know, we're here and we're here to do what we're supposed to be doing. And that that's, like you said, the universe and the pieces that fall in, it's very, it's, it's very much present in our daily lives. 
Did you get to talk to the family? We didn't. No, we didn't. Um, you know, I was able to get uh, through, you know, I was just able to to verify that was there a need for uh, children's education? Like, the, did the, but the person was so young that it. Uh, oh, right. You know, so that's kind of what we want to see. Is there anything that we can do to help? And, um, and the person was very young, so. As a member of the military, though, mm -hmm. West Point guy, the whole nine. How does it make you feel when you see, how do I want to put this? Deaths politicized. And let me expand upon that so that you fully understand. Let's use this Afghanistan situation that we're going to talk about in a minute as a full-blown example. This was a service member whose demise was not really covered. Right. No one talked about it. Yeah, no I don't think so at all. About yeah. what, like you wouldn't have even known about it unless you saw what was happening. It was like, oh, yes. I know what that is. Yes. And then a couple weeks later, and I'm not even saying this is wrong. I think we should cover all of them. But you see the tragedy where 13 people, whatever it was, it was a lot of people who were blown up in a suicide bomber. Yeah. Was covered extensively. Yes. And it was politicized. It was a fucking war in the media instead of, you know, full appreciation of the fact that they were who they were and they were doing a dangerous job that they were doing as a service member. What goes through your head when you see that? Just absolute sadness, you know, on every level. I mean, um, I just don't think I, I'm still not at the point where I can get away from that. You know, I, I just feel sad. You know, I feel sad. I feel, um, I just get to the point, you know, where I want to educate, you know, I want to, I want to lead by example as to the value and the impact that these kids have had uh, on our country. And, and, um, you know, I often, I often just kind of, I go into a bad place for a minute or two, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, it's, I, I just can't get – it's one thing that still just really has an effect. Um, and it could throw me, you know, in in years past, it could throw me for a loop. Now I'm, I'm much more capable of just using it as a chance to educate. You know, it sounds cold, but to say, like, see that, you know, that's – that's the real deal. Like that is the real deal. That's no movie. That's no ep episode of SEAL Team, or you know, that's the real deal. And that's that's where it's at, you know. And so that's how I I think sadness is the best way, but but also also a sense of urgency to to make people understand, you know. And, and it used to be the problem for me is it used to be sadness, uh, some post traumatic stress, and then a chip. You know, a chip on the, like, you motherfucker, you know, you don't fucking know. Stop putting your hand over your heart, that kind of thing, you know. And I think that's normal because you're still, you know, when you come back from anything, like I guess come back from two day or three day or and I'd still have that heightened, um, you know, kind of sense of, um, I don't even know how to, how to it's hard to explain it because I'm not there anymore. I don't want to go back there, but um, you're always kind of on edge. Mm. you know like a heightened sense of urgency you know like a heightened sense of you're you're very um aware of everything so what what normally would be to you or me or or to people like a car beeps the horn you know at somebody else in front of you um yeah you can you know now i'm good you're good you know just, oh, yeah, car beep, I'm find some asshole right but when you're in it that can that can be an issue, you know, sure. because you're always kind of on edge. You're always, you know, looking around. So I think that I've gotten, thank God, gotten through that and I can, I can deal with everything. And I just feel really sad for the family. I feel sad for what they're about to go through. And I'll be sad for the constant thought of, you know, until they can get to the point where it's an inspiration, you know, until mm. they can get where they and and a lot of folks never get there, you know, never get there. Um, nine eleven had the same feel, you know. On a on a honestly, man, on a probably worse. 
Because there was no expectation. Yeah. There was no expectation of that happening. Like, I don't care what anybody says. You you write that check. And, And I used to say all the time, it doesn't matter if you were in combat 100 times, once, never. You write that same check. And that check says, up to and including my life made out to the United States of right. America. Here it is. Right. So um, I just think it can happen to anybody. You know, anybody can have that sense. Any veteran can have the sense of that possibly occurring. The thought of it even. And and not to, I don't want to take away from at all. I yeah. want to be clear on that. Yeah. From any life that's lost in defense of the country overseas. Yeah. I think what makes something like a 9-11 so shocking is like you you say and it's the obvious point it's not expected of course but also when you are a military member you you made the ultimate sacrifice Mm -hmm. you took that risk like pat tillman who we use as an example i love that example it's so amazing what he did gave up all he was about to sign millions of dollars in that contract in the nfl and said fuck it i'm gonna go to i'm gonna go to fight absolutely and he lost his life sadly yeah but when you not that it takes away anything, but when you go over there, your family, your people around everyone, they know that there is a possibility. Yes. Maybe not an expectation. I don't want to go there. But there's a possibility yes. that the worst could happen. Yes. And it doesn't make it better when it does, but there is a special sacrifice that goes into that and there is an appreciation for the value of your life prior to you going over there that you have the mental and again, I don't want to say preparation, but you have the mental space in your head that like, hey, it could happen. Yes. Agreed. When you see a 9-11, when you see a San Bernardino shooter, when you see things like this, these are people, and I'm borrowing your words from last time. I don't know why I always hear this in my head, but when you talked about Jim Martello, you're like, dude went to work. That's it. He got up and he went to work. That's it. He was very good at his job. Loved Worked it. in New York. Loved his job. He went to work. That's it. 3,000 other people went to work that's it. that day or yeah. got on a flight, whatever. That's it. And I think that's what makes that so shocking and scarring. And and again, and, I, and I'm sorry if I've said this already, but I, I, want, I always want to make sure I hedge this because, again, we're on camera, we're on mics, and I'm talking with you, so I, I don't want to touch anything, whatever. So if you got to shut me down, shut me down. But with your own situation and the shit you've dealt with, on the battlefield in particularly, other places, but there in particularly. I, I think one of the most inspiring things for me is that your wife, Sheila, as you've said now on the last podcast and on you've mentioned on this one at least, she's an 9-11 widow. And she has to live with that, mm-hmm. you know? And that's that's not just a life changer, that's a life ruiner. It's not like, and again, not to take away from other people's deaths, but your husband didn't die of a heart attack. No, he went to work and a bunch of extremists flew a plane into the building. Like, it's insane. It is. I still, when I, like, it's 20 still years ago, digest. just happened. Yep. Right? Agreed. And you and me covered it a little bit on our last podcast. And there were was, was some cute little clips from there. Yep. But that was four months before. Yep. And then it just happened now two months ago. And part of it was reviewing the clips on that podcast and going through it and reliving it and then reliving the whole day because it was such a seminal anniversary but i i can't imagine even 20 years later living with that and so i think you we talked earlier on probably the last podcast about the universe working in some funky ways i think the fact that you and sheila found each other all these years later too i mean you didn't marry till what like 2014 2017 wow even later so like 15 years after whatever it was where you found each other you know, you have very different experiences. I mean, you were there on 9-11, but you weren't in the building, right? You know, your experience that's very personal. It's different, personal. yeah. It's, yes. it's, it's there. I mean, I felt back where I was, and, you know, it definitely was hypervigilance um, in a lot of ways. But you make a great point, and I think— You saw thing- guys die—I want to be clear, though. You saw guys oh. in, in your arms on the battlefield. That's a whole nother level. I saw, I saw some dudes—I saw some shit— and right at 9-11 and, and other places, you know, I'd say, like I've said to you, I've had worse times in the Bureau than I ever had anywhere else, you know. Really? Overseas. Yeah. I mean, Overseas. not worse times, but similar. And 
I think you the point you made that was great. I didn't um, know that, by the way. Yeah. I mean, I'm I'm opening up a little more as we kind of get there. But, um, you know, the point you made, which I think is is really well taken, and that is when the expectation is probably a good word because when you're deployed or a family member is deployed – and you see somebody pull up in front of the house, you fucking know exactly what that is, right? Yeah. When you had a 9-11, there was a hope that your guy was going to be the person that pulled up to the house. Not, And nobody pulled up to the house. Nobody. So when, you know, when I, when I traveled or when I went out on these casualty assistance jobs with the chaplain... I was the guy that pulled up to the house for nine eleven. No, not for nine eleven, but say. but okay. for, right, but nine eleven. Nobody pulled up to the house. People were waiting. They were putting photos up. They were, oh, I think I saw him. I think I, did. or I, oh, man, you know, he got out, but he, you know, I, I can't imagine that trauma. I can't imagine that trauma and. So much so that I can remember early on in Sheila and Mai's relationship when we got serious. And there was one morning that, you know, I just, I was up early and I didn't want to wake her up and I was heading out to the office and I just kind of, you know, went, opened the garage door, jumped in my car and out of the front door she comes. She's like, don't ever, ever leave without saying goodbye to me. Mm. And she said, you want to talk about post-traumatic stress, do that to me again, you know? So it's kind of like wow. that, and it's still to this day, it's like that. You know, there's not a night that goes by that, like, even we're sitting here and she's texting me, good night, you know, I want to make sure, like, it's, and I get it, you know? So I see it, the difference, there's really, it's so much more significant, not significant, but it's so, I think you prepare your time as a military spouse, as a military family member, that this could this could happen, mm -hmm. but you never think about something like that or a shooter or yeah. sending your kid to school, right, and never coming home or even even an accident, right? I mean, you've had experience losing friends in accidents, and even that is unexpected. You know, it's unexpected, but the military, I think, it does a they do a decent job at being that, you know, being that for, for everybody. I, I would love for my wife to be the, the subject matter expert in the military on how to get kids through and how to get families through because there's nobody better. I mean, that's she, pretty awesome. How she just saved lives. Man. Yeah. I watch her save lives. Talk every about day. that. If you don't mind. Yeah. Like what she, what she runs. Yeah. She runs. So back in 2015, um, she had always kind of thought about doing this, like having some type of, place for people to go oh wait you know? she did this 14 years later 14 years she didn't do it till 2015 oh i didn't know that yeah so she you know she raised her kids right so right. she didn't have time really she was a stay-at-home mom who who just you know did a great job with her kids did a great job with the kids and and when the two older ones went off to college she was like it's time and she tells a story about a dream that she had shortly after 9-11 and um, and Jim Martello was sitting in the the you know kind of the recliner that he always sat in, and that still sits in our living room, which I think is really cool. Her know? husband, her husband, and, and it's funny because every pet we've ever had sits in that fucking chair. So you can't tell me he's sitting right there, which freaks me out once in a while. And I tell him all the time, Jimmy, stop. You know, don't don't animals but know? They know. They I know. mean, they they know he's there, right? So, they know. but long story short, about this one is she um has he she has a stream, and in the dream. He says, hey, Sheil, um, I'm okay, you know, but if you were to ask me two weeks before 9-11, um, you know, if I wanted to leave you and go here where I'm at now, I would have to say, you know, absolutely not. But I want to I wanna be with my wife. But if you were to ask me now if I want to come back, no, I want to stay here. And he said, I'll, I'll wait for you and I'll, I'll save a place for all our loved ones, but I got to stay here. I'm happy here. And then she woke up. So as soon as she knew that, she was like, I got to find a place for these people. 
who are left behind because he's all right, but everybody else, and that's how the idea of Steffi's place came to be because Steffi was a was a veteran um, who died of cancer so and left three dream, kids behind. She had that dream years later. Years, no, she had that dream like in, in 2001. But she knew but she, she couldn't do okay. anything, so she set this place up, and, and it's almost like I I look who is at Steffi. It, I'm sorry, I cut Steff, you off. Steffi was a was a veteran who, um, one of Sheila's boys' hockey coaches' wife was sisters with this Steffi, mm. and Steffi passed, left three kids behind, three young kids who the sister actually went up adopting, which I think is a beautiful story. And Sheila said, I got to meet her a few times, and she was an incredible person. And she said to Sheila, without Sheila ever saying anything about the dream, she said, you know, I know I'm going to be okay, but I got to find a place for these kids to be all right. Mm -hmm. And so Steffi's place is, and people, it's droves of people that come to this place. Like it's free and, and you know, Sheila's got a budget and all she does is basically, you know, she fundraises once or twice a year and it's great. And we have golf tournaments. We have things that we can to kind of be there, but, but it's an amazing organization. It's an amazing place and it saved numerous lives. I and mean, people that walked in there, you know, two days after their child died and said, I don't want to live anymore. And now they're, they're supporting groups. They're they're orchestrating and and being, you know, uh, caregivers for people who are in the same boat and sharing experiences. It's am it's amazing. I also want to say this. Yeah. And if this out this is out of balance in some ways, I apologize and I'll take it out. But you know, like Sheila's a woman of a lot of means. Too. Yeah. Very much so. You know. Yep. She she needs a job like she needs a six hole in her. Head. Right. Right. She doesn't need to work. And. And so, she doesn't get paid. And I didn't so, know that it was years later too. Yeah, she's that's a that, to me that's that's and I don't I don't even know Sheila. Like we talked on the phone yep. once when, when yep. you were in there, but yep. yeah, I hear a lot about her and and obviously like through Larry over the years and everything, he's been yep. close with them forever, but that that's such a that's a beautiful thing to me. And like we talk about people quote unquote using a platform doing things for good. Sheila's not a public figure. Right? No. But she's no. got a platform in the sense that she got some cashish. Yep. And yep. instead of eventually finding, a, I hate the words move on, but eventually finding a way to live on. Right. You know, and like, okay, whatever, and dealing with it herself. She also helps a fuck ton of people. She wants she wants others to, to have the same experience of bitter versus better. You know, mm. that's her thing. And, you know, it's interesting because I don't know if I told you this, but around the Right around the time of the 20th anniversary, just a couple, you know, two months ago or a month, month and a half ago. Yeah, two months ago. We were, I have a an acquaintance who's a West Point graduate. He's a class of 03 guy. And um, his name is Joe Quinn. I love these class things, by yeah. the way. And 86. He's, a, he's an 03, 03. guy and he's, he's a good dude and he's, he's a good businessman. And he lost his 23-year-old brother. You sent me this article. I did. Yeah, I did. I'm going to... I can't put this on the video. It's an article. Yeah. I'm going to put this somewhere. Maybe I'll put it on my Instagram story or something. Yeah. I read this it's right amazing. when you sent it to me. It was it's incredible. Amazing. Yeah. But tell this, please. So, I mean, you know, Joe basically, I, I followed his uh, his blog and, and you know, he, he wrote some great things. I mean, some fabulous kind of introspective um, words of advice for guys who are looking for advice, even though I he wasn't thinking that, you know, just, wow, amazing, you know, amazing. So his 23-year-old brother died in the towers. And he was at West Point when his when brother happened, died. When it happened. Okay. And, um, and, and Joe went off to combat and did all the things that we did and, and fought on the war on terror and pretty, pretty exceptional. And um, along the way, he had written, like I said, some powerful pieces. And right around September 11th this year, he he wrote an article, and the heading of it was, this is the last words you'll ever hear me or read from me with regards to 9-11. And he said, um, and the article goes on to talk about not, not a never forget, but an always remember. And time to turn the page. And what he meant there was... Who does that is, tie into, by the way? Yeah. I mean, it's just pretty incredible with regards to don't... I don't want to remember the shit I've been through since 9-11 on the battlefield and doing the things I've done. I'd rather forget. 
powerful shit. Powerful shit. You know, I, I, I just want to, I, it's not a never forget, you know, I want to forget. I want to forget this. And, but you can't. And the last piece was basically, he talks about reading a book to his daughter, and that's what he kind of lines it up with. And he says, she never wants the book to end. She what wants to flip the again? page. And then keep going? Joe Quinn. Joe Quinn. And if you just run West Point. Yeah. Keep and, going. Um, keep going. You know, he's reading the book, and she keeps wanting to go back to pages that have passed because it's a pop-up book. And uh, daddy, I want to do this page. I want to do this page again. Let's go back to this. And he's talking about how turning back the pages in his life have been have been hard. And you know, the last piece is well, my wife comes in to bring my daughter to bed, and and um, we're on the last page, and she says it's time it's time to go to sleep. And he says, you know, basically it's time to turn the page. You know, and he has not written uh, about nine eleven, and I don't believe he will. So um, powerful piece powerful this is actually short enough i've never done this but i want to read this yeah are you okay with that absolutely i just i, I read this three times when yeah you sent it yeah and it's about a five minute read so congratulations people you get an audio book right now but <laughs> i just I, I again it, it and i want to say this it was already hitting me hard leading up this year yep to the fact that it was 20 years because that was such a seminal for all the bad reasons, moment in my life, mm -hmm. I was just old enough yeah. to understand what was going on. Not all the way, but yep. you, no, saw buildings go, you saw planes going to buildings and it was, was like, enough. well, that's not supposed to happen. Yep. And there's images, you know, like your mom picking you up from school, your teachers in school who all their families are in New York City and they're on the phone, tears. My teacher, yep. who I've said this on another podcast somewhere, but who did an unbelievable job. I, I can't, like, she should have been paid a million dollars for that day. Yep. Second grade teacher, just, like, sitting us all down, keeping her composure, and explain, like, imagine explaining that to, like, a seven, eight-year-old. No, I can't. And, but she explained it. Yep. It wasn't, wasn't like... There are people jumping out of the building and and committing. No, yeah. You know what I, you know what no, I mean? Like committing people, the most the bad hardest people have decision. Done, have hurt people, you know. Right. It was bad people have hurt people, and a lot of people are are dead. Yep. And I and I don't remember. It's crazy. I wish I remember so much about that day. Yeah. I wish I could remember exactly the words she said. But of course, I didn't appreciate it in the moment. I was like, oh wow, okay. No, but yeah. But later, thinking about it, you do. Even a few years later, when you're like eleven. 12 you start to think about that and you're like what yeah. an amazing teacher and yeah. she was an unbelievable teacher no nah, it sounds like i was it. at a friend's school so you had to call him teacher or whatever but yep. she was unbelievable but this this piece you sent me touched me because you know this and we talk about life happening in a weird way this guy he's sitting at one of the weirdest and craziest and also tragic crossroads of he'd already signed up for west point he's yep. there yeah you know, he, yeah he's committing his life to this stuff yeah. without at that point without the central cause there wasn't the no. main enemy that everyone was focused on and now suddenly not only do you have that but it it hit home your brother who didn't sign up for that by the way no new to another his job guy. yeah another 20, guy that just went to work yeah. 23 year old went 23. to work but yeah. yeah i'm gonna read this real quick yeah. jim yeah a little girl named Beckett doesn't want me to turn the page. I'm reading Elmo Christmas to her on a night in early September, a children's book filled with trap doors that she must open one by one. Therefore, the thin book takes longer to get through than anticipated, but regrettably, I'm not present because I can't stop remembering 20 years ago. Never forget. A phrase forever linked to 9-11, but for me, it's forever linked to my brother Jimmy. As too many pe people now, by now know, he died that day, and I can never forget how he died. I can never forget my asthmatic brother looking down from the 104th floor of the North Tower as smoke billowed up. I can never forget him being scared, the fear in his eyes. I see them and it. I can never forget him suffocating, of the building falling, him collapsing. When I hear never forget, I can never forget his beautiful face. I can never forget his beautiful face burning, moving, melting, but never fading. Perhaps too graphic but there's a price to pay for not forgetting. Two weeks before the towers fell, I'll never forget the back of Jimmy's head 
as he sat at the desk next to our childhood bunk bed while I rushed out of our Brooklyn home in a mad scramble to get back to West Point before taps without saying goodbye, without saying I love you. I'll never forget his gruesome death where, we, where we'd never find his remains and being so filled with anger that I was willing to deploy anywhere the president wanted to send me and with the passage of the authorization for use of military force, I love that he went into this, by the way, AUMF, the president was granted by Congress the ability to send me anywhere. So after graduating West Point, I was prepared for Afghanistan, but was sent to Iraq. Which, side note real quick, all the service members who had to do that and, and didn't go, quote unquote, where they would rather go, that's not their fault. Mm -hmm. And not that, not the the media, I give the media a lot of shit. Not that they do that, Mm -hmm. but we forget that sometimes. Yeah. These guys were doing their job. A lot of them signed up to go to the Taliban that now fucking took over. Yep. All these years later, because we handled it wrong and took our eye off the ball. Obama was right about that. He was, I I agree with him a hundred percent. It's like, we we took our eye off the ball. Right. But I appreciate someone who was in the middle of that saying it like that, because it's important. Anyway, I'm sorry. I'll never forget my brothers in arms who were six of the 4,598 U.S. service members killed in Iraq. They were shot out of a Chinook. I'd pack their gear up in duffel bags to be sent home to their parents of the young and the wives of the old, the ones in their mid-twenties, with one wife of a sergeant carrying their unborn child. I held a picture of the ultrasound in my hand for a second before stuffing it in the olive drab bag. If he couldn't be a father, then neither should I. I'll never forget although I've tried. In between tours in Iraq, I'll never forget a brown-eyed girl I met named Melanie, a girl I I fell in love with. I lost one brother, but she lost two. Her brother Jeff to an IUD on a bridge in Iraq, her brother Kevin to suicide. We'd talk about our shared losses. We'd talk about having a family, having kids. But a year before bin Laden was killed, we thought it could never work. I could never be a father. She could never be a mother. Because I would never forget my brother, and she'd never forget hers. I'll never forget one of my best friends who was killed in, in Afghanistan. I agreed to go, grab a beer with him before he took off to Afghanistan, but I never showed up. He was killed a couple weeks later, one of the 2,443 U.S. service members killed in Afghanistan. And sometimes I try to grab a beer with him still. One for me, one for him in front of an empty chair. Sometimes I try to forget him with several beers, but it doesn't work. Trust me, I've tried. I'll never forget my translator. Remind me to talk about this, by the way. I want to ask you about this. Dale in Afghanistan. We'd always joke about how our Italian colleague would call everyone a quote-unquote shit guy. We'd drive around to meetings with elders, governors, and generals. He'd drive. He'd translate. He'd save my life. He'd bring the whole chickens to the base. We'd feast. After coming back from a big meeting with a big American general over a big Afghan dinner, our Italian colleague asked what he thought of the big-time general. He'd respond, quote, he's a shit guy. (laughs) Regrettably, I've lost contact with Dale, but most likely he's been left behind, dead or hiding, and that's what I want to talk about, fighting for his life. And thank God there are organizations like No One Left Behind and better people than me advocating to bring our Afghan allies home. Since 9-11, I spent the first 10 years remembering and the last 10 years unsuccessfully forgetting. I've learned that forgetting is impossible, but holding on is a choice. I was prepared to let it all go until I came across an image of a Marine sergeant, who was a baby on 9-11, cradling an... I saw this. This was amazing. Cradling an Afghan baby in her arms, who was one of the 13 U.S. service members killed by a suicide bomber at the Kabul airport. Kabul airport. It makes me want to go back. It makes me want to go back to the Kabul airport where I landed so many years ago to fight the war of necessity. It makes me want to go door to door looking for Al-Qaeda to avenge my brother's death without my friends and 46,000 Afghan civilians being killed. It makes me want to go back to Iraq without Jeff and 185,000 Iraqi civilians being killed. It makes me want to go back without Kevin and 30,177 veterans taking their own lives. This guy hit everything. It makes me want to avenge the 13 U.S. service members just killed, this was in August, without killing seven Afghan children by an American drone strike. It makes me want to avenge our losses without the 7,552 U.S. military deaths, the 30,177 suicides, and the 600,000 civilian deaths during the war on terror. 
It makes me want to go back to fight the war without any of the consequences. But war always has consequences. Mostly suffered by the lower enlisted troops and the civilians caught in between the roadside and precision bombs. It makes me want to go back and ask Vietnam veterans for forgiveness. They warned me how it would end. I didn't listen. I apologize for them for it. I love them for it. I'll warn a young soldier one day. She won't listen. By the way, shout out to those guys because it wasn't their fault they were over there. But as we collectively lament the sad, horrific, and, and incompetent exiting of the war, if we're being honest with ourselves, we know the war will never truly be, be over until we rip... I'm sorry, rip up the authorization for use of American force, a UMF, that gives the president, regardless of party, unlimited power to extol the treasure of our taxes and the blood of our sons and daughters on any war of their choosing. Repealing the AUMF without conditions is the only true way to end the forever war forever. I'd like to go back to prevent the AUMF, but most like, mostly, I'd just like to go back to have that beer with my friend. I'd like to go back to that bridge in Iraq to tell Jeff to bring his men to safety. I got it from here. I'd like to go back to Kevin and all veterans and tell them that it's okay. I've been there too. You don't have to be perfect. You just have to be you. You're not alone. People want to hear your story. I want to hear your story. I'd like to go back to finally tell Jimmy. I'd like to go back to finally tell Jimmy goodbye. While I can never truly forget you, it's time to let you go. So goodbye, my brother. Goodbye, my friend. I'll be missing you. And while the word love does not suffice how I feel about you, it's the only word we got. I love you. This is what I'm thinking about when I'm not present. But this little girl named Beckett snaps me back to attention without hope or with hope in her big brown eyes. I see them and it. With mischief and determination, she must name every character in the book. Big Bird, she says, always pointing. Bert, Ernie, Elmo. And when she gets to Cookie Monster, she points at me laughing and says, Daddy. When we get to the last page, she refuses to turn it, but wants to go back to the beginning, reopen all the trap doors, do the same thing over and over again because she's a child who just can't let go, who doesn't believe in tomorrow. In walks Beckett's mother with our son in her arms. Melanie says it's time to go to bed. It's time to turn the page. I get the goosebumps reading that. It's good stuff. Yeah, good stuff. Truly. It's, uh, it's deep. It's well written and it's from a good dude. Yeah, thank you for passing that on. Yeah, that was, that was awesome. But I, I, I wanna, I wanna get to the difficult topic that's been in the middle of this at hand, which is how it ended. Mm -hmm. And to me, it was a sick, sadistic, twisted, just evil of a symbolic ending. And you know, to even put myself in the in in the shoes of someone who lost a family member on that day or lost a family member in the war afterwards to see Afghanistan fall to the Taliban was it's beyond words. And while vice gets a lot of shit these days for the nature of some of their reporting, I will say I still enjoy a lot of content depending on what it is from vice. And they put out some amazing reporting leading up to this in Afghanistan. They were trying to sound the alarm and then they put out amazing reporting while it was happening. And there was a there was one woman, which I was shocked at, given the Taliban, who went open cover with the Taliban. They invited her in, which I don't know if that's like progressive. Who the fuck knows? But all right, whatever. They bring her in and they weren't progressive when she got there mm. because they were still doing their bullshit. I'm going to cut off your hand for taking a goat tribunals and stuff and talking about the – the implementations they wanted to do. And the point is the writing was on the wall. Mm. And I want to turn it over to you to talk about what went wrong here and in your estimation how it went wrong. And we can go all into this. But one thing I do want to say is that when we look at Afghanistan and how it went down, every president since Bush – it's been a popular thing to say, and I agree with it, that we must endless end this endless war. That it's Joe, right? Joe yes. spoke of in this yes. article. That forget the fact it costs a lot of money and taxpayer dollars. It's it. You're sending service members over there to fight in the line of battle for what? For what? 
And the one thing that is a for what is the Afghan people who were caught in the middle of this as well. And I'm not talking about the ones who support the Taliban. I'm talking no, about I all understand. the ones who, who, yeah. who don't want to do that. Yeah. And we took our eye off the ball. This war started to go south, talking to people who were there in 2003 when we went to Iraq. And for 17 years, even if we were talking about plans over and over again to leave, we didn't have a plan in place. I don't care who it was. We've seen the execution now, and the execution was terrifically bad. I mean, yep. it, was, it was epically bad, I should say. But we, we never we, – we could have seen this. We did see this. We, we knew what this power vacuum looked like. We, we, we knew what a fucked up place this is given its, the nature of its history and its location and geography. And yet this still happened. And so one thing to address right away that I'd love you to give an open opinion on, whatever it is, is the people who are saying, including some service members, I think – I think I've seen that, who are saying we're concerned that people died in vain here. I don't like to think that, but I'm curious what your thoughts are. Yeah, I mean, I you know, I have to start it off with saying obviously that's a concern, you know, is is those family members that I know, especially the McHughes and you know, Kelly his daughter and He died in and, Afghanistan? Yeah, John died in Afghanistan. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know. I thought yeah. he died in, in No, Iraq. May eighteenth, two thousand ten, right at the airport. Probably I would say feet from where those 13 service members were killed, <laughs> literally the same intersection. So, you know, I think that was my big concern up front was how is Connie, how is the family, you know, how are they doing with regards and to, to it? And, you know, they're, they're a pretty faithful family. So, you know, they kind of help us through it as a class like you know and there's others that have died that we know you know um, along the way uh, i mean not necessarily my class but others you know that we know from west point and, and other locations that we've either led or have served with us and i i just i have a hard time as an american service member ever ever talking about a life in vain, you know, mm -hmm. lost in vain. I, I just do. I, I, I don't think I'll ever be able to do that. You know, um, that being said, um, I, I just feel that for so many years and, and, and listen, I would, we were all, you know, I've got so many, I mean, many, many, many of us were there in one capacity or another. Um, and it's just, it's hard for me to say this, but it, it, it's a really kind of poorly executed. Joe, Joe hits it on on the head, you know, with regards to a president that can just make a universal decision to send anyone anywhere at any time. You know, it's just not the way it, it, it should ever be. And I get the I get the knee jerk um, initially with regards to. These towers are burning. They've stayed burning for months and months, and the Pentagon is burning. And there's a plane, you know, 800 feet in the ground in Shanksville, PA, and and um, let's rally America and let's go and let's go to a World Series game and watch the president throw a first pitch out and all the shit that everybody thinks is great until you're there, until mm -hmm. you're in that shit hole, you know. And um, it still goes back to I can never, I can never be that. Cold is the wrong word, but can, can never feel that any any life was ever left or lost in vain. And what I do what I do worry about is those left behind, um, because I think they're just being executed, and there are people that were of va value to this country. And I had experience with it, you know, in um, in Iraq with regards to what we called the Sons of Iraq funds that were given out and in incredible volumes of cash that were given to informants in, in Iraq. Wait, question. You, yeah. I knew you were in the Middle East and everything. I didn't know you were, you went to Iraq too? Yeah. I mean, we had investigations for service members ripping off money because what happened was the, the dynamic was just what's kind of going on now. And the dynamic was I develop a source and I pay them a lot of money, right? In order to give me information on what the buildup is, what the terrorist groups or organizations are planning and plotting and where they are, where they're located and what they've done. And 
these motherfuckers are like so so violent and so barbaric that mm. they would find these folks and just execute them, you know, with the money and then they'd hang the money around their neck. So the dynamic that happened was a lot of service members were like, you know, fuck this, we're not giving them the money, so we'll put the money in our pockets, mm. which is bad, but it's also a post-traumatic piece. And, you know, you can't forgive it. And it's like a bank robber that gives the money back the next day. It, you still robbed the fucking bank, you know? So we had to deal with that along the way. And that was a big part of my job over there was to deal with some of those issues. And you had to, as a, as a service member yourself, you had to go over there. Well, no, as an FBI agent. I know, so, but, but as in, yeah, I, I'm sorry, yeah, ex-service member. But I mean, member. you know, I think that's the right person to do it because you talk the talk and you you... You get but, it. But but that, it is a, it was a, you know, just everything about it was uncomfortable. There, there was no, there was never, if you think it goes all the way back to the early 90s, you know, there was no true mission. You know, there was no way to possibly, if we didn't learn from what the Russians, what the Soviet Union discovered in Afghanistan along the way for 20 years, like we didn't learn the lesson. You know, we didn't, we didn't look and research and we had some smart people. We had some solid smart people. And, and even to today, you know, we had good people sitting in the White House that were recently that just weren't, you know, just, just didn't, didn't see it. They never saw it because it, it wasn't a priority? I mean... Was it ever a priority? I don't know. You know, mm. I mean, I just think that... That's scary. If you think about... There, there's a lot of other things that we could go... We can go to, down some pretty productive rabbit holes. You Let's know, do hate, it. But, but, I mean, I think, like, in order to do that, you know, you got to kind of understand... And it's all speculation on my part, but what I think you got to understand is that we, we never truly had a joint understood mission. There was never an objective. I mean, I'm a military guy. I never saw an objective. What about at the beginning? Well, we did a great job and yeah. All right. So I'll give them, I, I think we did a great job at decentralizing, you know, the terrorist organizations. Agreed. And that was important. Yeah. That was really, and it really even up until a couple of years ago, honestly, like I believe that. I believe up until a couple of years ago, we had a handle. We had a firm handle on who was who and where, and we were whacking them one by one and knocking them off. And then um, the big mistake is, you know, <laughs> not guarding that airport, you know, basic gates and guard shit, not guarding that airport, not sending the 82nd over to be, the combat troops that they are and the, the way they're trained until it was too late. 82nd Airborne. Yeah. Not not using all of our, and we've, we've been guilty of this before, not using all our resources, not, we don't have to play by the rules of engagement when we're in these situations. We don't have to ride on the fucking sides of the road. You know, we, we can ride down the middle of the road, that kind of shit. We can use armored vehicles in order to clear houses. We took that philosophy that was supposedly, you know, oh, it's 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 a it's a kinder, gentler, you know, military to people that didn't have any respect for life, you know, and we we allowed ourselves to be brought into, you know, brought into that situation. And I just struggle with it. I mean, I I, I have a hell of a time making sense of it. I, I just do. I, I don't know what I don't know who to blame. I, I've I've done a lot of reading on it. I've done a lot of talking to people on it. I, I'm not. I'm just not sure we had adequate resource and leadership. You know, I don't I'm think just, it's... I'm just not sure of it. You know, I, I I can't I can't put my finger on anything. Um, it, it's sad. It's not recent. Like here's the here's the one thing, and I'm not. I also. I'm not going to defend Biden at all on on how the pullout was one of the worst executed yeah, things it, you'll ever see. It was atrocious. But it's also period. not like the resource issue is not a recent thing. No. We've been doing like for a long but, time it's been like like and frankly it started with Obama talking out loud about how we were going to the number of troops we were going to pull out, which to me like I understand your intention. That's fucking crazy. That's like saying to the other team, "Here's the plays we're going to run on this drive." Well, I mean, it's the same. It's the same. You know, announce a date and then don't have 
a plan. Crazy. And don't have scare and think these people aren't going to rip across that kind. They're all they're they're violent killers. They're not. It's not like you're dealing with people you can negotiate with. You know. I mean, I'll be honest. My buddy did the best job that's been done. Pompeo fucking had those people at the table. He did that. Let's, you know, let's he, talk, he did let's a great talk job. That. On what, that. This was so, the this was the Taliban. Yeah, negotiate the drop arms. Yeah, I mean, and he had it done. You know. And, okay. And then we had, uh, you know, whatever happened, happened, and and the election takes place. These these fucking people aren't capable. I mean, they're they're non military people. They're not capable. They don't understand. They don't. They've never been in a tough situation. They've been, you know, all of them. Trump's been a career fucking businessman. Fucking Biden is a career politician who couldn't even keep his fucking family together. And the rest of them are fucking knuckleheads. You know, I mean, there's the Secretary of State now. Who's this clown? You know, like I mean. Mark Milley, I, I'm going all over the place because I'm, I'm getting a little tired too. Yeah. But um, you know, I'm not as I'm not as sharp on this um, right now. But it's it's just frustrating. You know, it's frustrating beyond belief. I don't have any answers. I don't know enough about it. To, I don't know enough inside information. You know, I know what I saw. I know what bothered me um, back when. Um, but it's it's. To have people jumping out of, you know, off of aircraft. Yeah. Like, come on. You know, like you, and, and to have a guy that doesn't even have the ability to stand up and make a statement about it and, and the world's, I mean, there's no, there's no doubt. That was four or five days ago. The, there's no doubt the guy, crazy. The, the, the world is looking at us and, and they're just waiting. They're waiting. Something's coming to the side. I'm telling you. That's Mark scary. my words. And we're not ready for it. Well, here's a question because you just brought it up. I forgot about this too. Yeah. What is the story, if you know it, behind the whole Taliban negotiation? Because I would, I'm not gonna lie, I would have had the opposite reaction to that. I don't know too like, much about it. I Pompeo mean, was, and and I don't know that it was him versus like Trump was telling him to do this. I mean, that is kind Trump of, never told him to do anything. Really, <laughs> Trump never told Pompeo to do anything. Screamed at him. I fucking that dude's the most clueless fucking dude in the world. Yeah, he's a fucking idiot. He and does tell people what to do, idiot. though. Yeah, and they don't listen. It's like, listen. You ever have a boss that just screams at you? Yeah. In the first two weeks, it's like, whew, this guy knows. And then the rest of the time, you're like, nah, eh, he's just gonna scream. He gives a shit. He doesn't mm -hmm. know what he's talking about. That's what I see. The guy spent all his time on a toilet bowl, fucking tweeting. You know, no clue. I mean, they they. Everybody tried. Anybody that had any influence with the guy tried. You know? Now, it wasn't a vote for Joe Biden. It was a vote against Donald Trump. Yes. Agreed. It wasn't a vote for Joe Biden. Agreed Joe Biden. 100%. Are you fucking kidding me? Guy's, guy's a zero. He's been a zero for his whole life. You he's know? He's asleep at the wheel. He's asleep. He's asleep at the wheel, but he never did anything before for whatever, how many years. And then, you know, bringing in the administration he's brought in, you know, I mean... Uh, you know, Millie fucking cowering to Nancy Pelosi. You know, I mean, come on, man. You know, that's an example to me of the politics. I can never say this word politicization of the military. And I know you know, Mark, but you know, I, I and I've ripped, I've ripped them on the phone with you. I'll rip them now again. I see a guy there who, when you look at his public actions, where in the span inside of a year, he goes from escorting Trump behind tear gas to a church during the George Floyd Disa riots disaster. to hold up a Bible, yeah. like in his fatigues, to nine months later lecturing America on critical race theory and, and how he wants to know white rage. Yeah. To me, like, I I'm not even saying, like, I'm going to judge either one, though I will. Like, assume I didn't do that. That's an opportunist to me. And then when I, and I don't know how much of it is, you know, political war, but. When I hear things like he contacted his – whatever it's called, his similar ranking officer in the fucking Chinese military in January. No, I know some shit was going I mean, down. Yeah, I know the, it was bad. That's that's not a friend. I mean the contact you – know, right. I mean the CCP is should never be considered a friend. Not but, a friend. But at the same time, you know, I, I just think that <laughs> – we are we are on the road to third world countrydom 
It's going to happen. You know, hopefully it's not in my lifetime, but the signs are there. <laughs> you know, signs are there. I mean, you know, little examples that I see every day. Like my produce fucking going, you know, times three from August to today. Gas prices in California at nine bucks. You know, I mean, what the fuck? You know, I mean, like, we're, we're, this country's asleep at the wheel. So if you don't think that there's opportunities for attacks, you're crazy. You know, you're crazy. You're crazy. Got national security advisors that couldn't get a fucking, they wouldn't be able to get a basic clearance. I, I want to get to that. I just don't want to get off Afghanistan. I want to, I want to make sure we, we, we cover some of this. The, the very, like, I believe in symbols a lot when you look at history and how history weirdly repeats itself. Afghanistan is the, the graveyard of quote unquote empires. It is a very weirdly yeah. located place. It is landlocked. It's, it hard, is, it's hard to fight. It's it, hard to fight there. It's hard to make a difference. It's hard to, and, and we had it done. You know, we had it done. We, we needed to bail out of there years and years and years and years and years ago, but we didn't. Because well, we, we had need, it done. We went to Iraq. Well, we needed a war. I mean, we needed a war, right? Well, we needed to, listen, we needed to get, you couldn't, you couldn't attack Saudi. So you had to fucking go into Afghanistan, right? Because that's the next best place with regards to any type of shelter for our boy, right? So um I don't I don't know. I wish I was I wish I was more knowledgeable of what the actual mission was. I don't know. I couldn't tell you. Maybe there was. Maybe there was. Um I just think it was it was retribution, you know, for a parts fair. these thirty five hundred people who died. Um, we've never done that before. <laughs> no, well, well, I mean, I could think of it that way for World War II, but that was yeah, different because we went was, into a full. We had to be, yeah. I mean, two war. fronts, yeah. yeah, two fronts, and it's you, a had little to, different. you had to stop a, a dude who was fucking killing generations and generations of people. Right. I mean, that's different. You know, it's, it's different. different. And in Japan, you know, they needed us. They needed us in that war as much as we needed to be in that war. You know, I mean, um. Who knows what that kook fucking would have done, you know, yeah. in Europe. So that was some crazy shit. So it's kind of like, I get that whole piece. You know, I understand. But there's no other reason. We, we stopped short in, you know, 91 of moving across and destroying something that Schwarzkopf said wouldn't have been a problem. It wouldn't have been a problem. We could have- Which was? We could have marched right through Iraq and fucking destroyed and, and took that back then. And just had a North Korea kind of, South Korea kind of look, you know, just had a stabilization force there for the rest of the time. And none of this shit would have ever happened. Would that have prevented 9-11? I think so. I mean, I think How a so? lot of things would have. Well, so not, one thing about Saddam Hussein, intel. he didn't like terror. He didn't like terrorists. No, a basic intel would have, would have, basic intel sharing would have prevented. We had it. In Iraq? We had it. Not in just Iraq, but along the way. I mean, shit, you had a bombing in fucking 93. Oh, yeah, we had a In the towers. We had a bombing in the fucking yeah. World Trade Center. You knew they were going to do it. We then, fucking put reports forward to Carson Dunbar in New York, fucking the worst FBI agent in history, and then went on and took over the New Jersey State Police. You know, the guy's a moron. Was he the head of counterterrorism yeah, yeah. before? Uh, and he gets the report. They send him a report. Hey, there's dudes in Arizona. 63-page report. Dudes in Arizona, all they want to do, they don't, they don't give a shit about taking off or landing. They just want to learn how to steer the fucking aircraft. Well, he was our in, guys. He wasn't in charge of counterterrorism. Yes, he was. No, John O'Neill was. No, John O'Neill was New York's counterterrorist. Right. Carson Dunbar was fucking New York's guy. He was oh, the he was, Oh. Yeah, he was the assistant director in charge there. It and he didn't show to that him. to Don and, 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 to John you know, O'Neill. Listen, O'Neill was <laughs> O'Neill was busy drinking and fucking banging chicks. You know, he let's did. Be honest. Well, let's be honest about that. But he also, I won't take this from him. I mean, he, he sounded the alarm over and over again. He did it in D.C. too. He did it at these meetings. I mean, it's it's verified. If you watch Looming Tower, they'll make you believe that. You don't think so? No, no. I think the key was the the key was very if if the first bombing doesn't trigger some type of defense mechanism that stays on that for the rest of time, just like we've forgotten now. Mm. Fuck, just wait. I'm telling but you, you. You like that documentary, or not documentary? You like that series because of what it, some of the things it showed that were true themes, like the discord between. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we were talking that, about that last. Well, time. That, well, that's the issue, 
right? So the issue is no information was shared. Right. You can't get past that. Anything you look at, you can't get past the fact that we had, a, you know, a school kid could fucking connect that. We chose not to because of personalities like John O'Neill. Well, the guy, I will just say. Just abrasive as shit. Or Mary Jo White sitting as the U.S. attorney, you know, at the time. Just abrasive. Like, just abrasive personalities and no better than everybody. That was the problem. Well, the guy. Didn't listen to the military. You the, know, I mean, The guy at not. the CIA was the worst. Have you yeah, ever heard even, that? I don't I, even know. I don't know that that guy's even a truthful character. Probably honestly, not. Honestly. Have you heard his testimony at the 9-11 commission? I've heard. I mean, yes, I've heard and studied it, you know, along the way. I've, um, but I've never heard something like what he said that wasn't in a shitty Hollywood movie. He said, at, at, this is a direct quote, at the 9-11 commission, they were asking him about his relationship with John O'Neill. Because whether or not, and I understand the other stuff was true, he did say, whether or not he was sounding it every day, He's on record. He did say this shit like, yo, this guy Bin Laden's fucking coming here. He was the guy over there in Nairobi investigating. Some of his people died too. He was the guy at the USS Cole, which you know about too, was investigating. Like he was on the ground with this shit. And the guy at the CIA, Michael Shore, who hid a lot of this stuff from him. He was the head of, what was it called? Alex Station, which was the Bin Laden unit. At the 9-11 commission, he was asked about his relationship by one of the senators with john o'neill and they said something along, i'm paraphrasing they said something along the lines of to michael Schur, the senator said and mr Schur, you did not have a good relationship with john o'neill and when you were asked about his death you you didn't like reflect that you were upset about it and he said Yes, sir, and I'd like to add that I said the only good thing to come out of that day was that those two buildings fell on top of him. <laughs> yeah. That's some Dr. Evil shit. But but that also tells you that the mission to John O'Neill was not as important as John O'Neill. You think so? I he, What job did the guy get? Here, here's what I think it says. What, did the, what job did the guy get? I think John O'Neill, and I think this is reflected on the record, I think it's that same problem we had talked about, which was he was at the FBI. FBI's at that time, especially police, they arrest, they make the case, they put it in court. He wanted to arrest and bring back CIA, sometimes not for the right reasons here. They're all about cultivating that information. And so they wanted to cultivate and John O'Neill was not going to do that. But why did John O'Neill want to bring back an arrest? Oh, definitely for the credit of that, no doubt. Period. Of course, yeah. Period. What did I say before? What What is the true sign of someone whose intent is for the good of the bigger organization? Intel. Mm. Was there ever development of Intel in John O'Neill's watch? Never. I don't think so, no. Never. Yeah. Bingo. And in fairness to him, that wasn't his job description. It wasn't his job. He, he, he pushed himself into every big case. I can remember. I rem I witnessed it. We'd be like, this guy's a fucking clown. Here we go again. We're fighting with this one. Like It was kind of like, listen, man, we just want to get this shit done. We don't need to be fucking fighting with everybody. There's no need. I go in, I do the job. I collect this, I do that. I talk to these three people, I'm out. I don't need to. I don't need to fight. I, what are we fighting for? Mm. And so that carried over at a critical time, at a critical, critical, critical time. That that relationship carried over, and quite frankly, it cost us because of egos. It mm. cost us a chance to at least deter some of what happened. Honestly, and I think I look at. I have a lot of respect for for the Bush family because of what they did for Sheila. You know what what W did for Sheila. I, I can never take it away from that. What he did, and um, but at the same time, what else were we going to do? What when th there was nothing else? They came on our soil, on our watch, and blew up. It, it was the greatest military operation in probably the history of the world. 
the preciseness of what they did. Yeah. And then, you know, so those who don't want that to be true have to kind of theorize the, we blew up our own buildings. <laughs> Fucking nuts. I'm, but, glad, but I'm, glad, I'm glad you brought that up real quick. Yeah. Nuts. It drives me nuts. Nuts. It's nuts. It's, it's, it's treasonous. Mm. Uh, you know, ultimately, but, but my point on that is egos, in my opinion, caused the lack of intel to allow us to make appropriate tripwire decisions, right, on how to stop this and listen to the chatter and not be worried about shit. Secondly, after the towers went down, they came to, I came on our soil and they fucking did what they did. It's never happened. Pearl Harbor was terrible. Pearl Harbor wasn't CONUS. No, and it, it was, was military uh, outlying. Too. It was military. Yeah. This, they did what they did, right? And we missed it. What are we going to do? What, what what can we do except we're, we're the strong, to, to save face, we're the strongest military force in the world. We have to go. Why did we not hold to this day, and I never asked you about this, like how Sheila feels about this, but... Why did we not hold Saudi Arabia accountable? And well, that's been every administration. Well, I way. think, I think, listen, I think to, in me, it's a simple answer, right? Oil, period. Right. But at the same time. Money. Money. Follow the money. But, but the other thing that I think has happened more recently, um, and this guy, this guy will take credit, just kind of like, listen, you know, you come off of, an, of, of a, what the world considers a kook you can take credit for shit, right? But it's the same kind of dynamic. You've studied it, you know, Carter giving in to Reagan and Reagan taking credit for the release of the Iranian hostages, right? So this release of documents, most recently, not all, but pretty decent. My personal opinion, and I I have not seen anything. I got to look at this. Biden released some of these now? I want to say, yeah, I, for some reason, yeah. Sheila, Keep Sheila going. mentioned it Keep to going. me. Um, but I think it's, I, I think it's a pretty open and shut case to, to be able to prove that, you know, the home of bin Laden, Saudi Arabia, and I think arguably what, one of the top 10 richest families in mm -hmm. the history of the world. Um, how could, how could there not be some type of. Um, tie back how could there not be you know a restitution piece so coming from that country it does i just have it behind us to make sure we have does it say way. anything or no so it did they didn't do everything it seems like a small step yeah which is probably not the 9-11 families i'm sure are pissed but, about but this, it's enough it's, it's enough to go to it's enough to go i think that what they did is they were they were able with that to go back and continue the process in court I think so. Right. So just real quick, uh, this is from Reuters, September 12th, because Biden, I'll give him some credit for this. I guess he released it the next day. He was not some of the 9-11 families at their personal memorial as sitting president, as they had said to previous presidents, if they're not released, don't come, don't show up right, right. to our thing. So then the next day he released it. The FBI on Saturday released a newly declassified document related to its investigation of the September 11, 2001 attacks on the United States and allegations of Saudi government support for the hijackers following an executive order by President Joe Biden. The partially redacted 16-page document released no, by the so FBI. It's nothing. It's not a lot. No. On the 20th anniversary, the attacks detailed contacts between the hijackers and several Saudi officials, but it did not draw a definitive conclusion whether the government and Rida – I never say that right – Rida was – complicit in the attacks which killed nearly 3000 and when we look at this data i mean it's it's to me it's clear they didn't plan it they weren't sitting there saying bin Laden, well here's the plane where they weren't doing that but they were very aware of what was going to happen even if not the dude total was, medium you know dude was on the fucking radar for how many years a long time leading man. up to that you know time. shit i mean they had i think in the clinton administration right they had sights oh, yeah. on them Oh, yeah. Bill Pretty didn't. Sure. They say that by the end, Bill got it. Yeah. By the end, he was like, okay, these guys, bad. Let's get them. But there was a shot or before they had fully convinced them. They had a shot at him. Yeah. But they were so. pretty sure it was him in the earliest days, I believe, of drones in like 96, yeah, 95. They definitely, they definitely had him. They saw a six foot four figure walking on top and, and he didn't because he wasn't sure. 
And I don't want to be a hypocrite and actually like yell at him for this because I yell at presidents for overusing drones and, and fucking creating warmongering opportunities where they kill innocents, you know? And then it's like, look, your daughters and sons died. It's on them. Let's go after them. So yeah. in some ways, I don't want to criticize that, but God damn. If you're, no, you got to take that shot. I mean, Jesus Christ. They had him. You got to take that shot. You got to take I that think. shot. I think. But yeah, I mean, I just think that it's, you know, I, I'm, I'm convinced, I, I'm, I totally believe that Saudi's 100% responsible, you know, for the part that they played in it. Um, but, you know, is that ever going to happen in my lifetime? No. You know, not it, a chance. I mean, you always talk about this follow the money. Yeah. We saw it again with the Jamal Khashoggi incident, which was just was a slap in the face to the world. Yeah. I mean, so obvious. Oh, God. And nothing happened. Well, well, that's that's the result that's what happens when you have 20 year wars that produce the exact same mm. result as day one <laughs> with Taliban running all over the country, executing fucking hanging people from buildings. You know, that's what happens. You know, I mean, nobody, everybody's scared to go do anything. And this guy, this, this, this guy in the white house, he's just, I'm not saying, you know, I'm not saying anything personally about the guy. I mean, I have some views on, his behavior leading up to, you know, his, a bunch of different things that I believe, but ultimately he's just seen as a weak figure. You know, he, he's not, he's not a guy that the world's going to respect. They're laughing at him. I mean, you see it all over the place. There's, if you, you can Google any kind of news report from anywhere in the world and everybody's laughing, showing his mistakes and everything. And that's not good. You know, that's hence, hence why, um, you know, big government to me is is scary. You know, it's just yeah. scary to be dishing out everything to everybody. It just takes away incentive, and it doesn't matter. It, it, it cuts across race. It cuts across you know economic status. It, it cuts across everything. Doesn't matter who you are, what you are. It, we're in trouble. And just to be clear, on the I guess part one of this podcast, where I was checking the balance of a good FBI agent like you talking about it in the middle of a case where of course you see what's happening here and you want the objective. Right. When I check it with that, I'm not checking it because of you. I'm checking it because of the other people in your position who aren't like you, who get there. And, you know, and there are some who then no, there's definitely this is used some. and that's used as an opportunity. You talk about the big government like that. It's used as an opportunity to expand that and to create precedent. You know, like, like, you, and this isn't our country, granted, but, I mean, look at Australia right now. Well, I mean, you know, we're not going to have enough time to create precedent. <laughs> what do you mean? We're going to be in trouble, bro. We're in trouble. We're in trouble. And I just don't know who the right person is to, to come in and, and heal it. You know, I just, we're, we're just... I mean, the shit that's happening out there, the way things are going, there's no cause or concern for, you know, where, where, t what tomorrow brings, you know, and I, and that's sad. It's sad for the kids. It's sad for, you know, younger Americans who are, um, you know, I mean, who's going to serve in the military besides Texas and Alabama? Wow. That's one way to put it. Right. Who's going to do it? California's going to go out there? No. Northeast going to go out there and be war heroes? No. I think that we've created, like you talk about the who's going to come in here and solve it. If you have a D or an R next to your name, I don't think you do now by default. I don't care if you're the second coming of Jesus Christ. Unfortunately, that's where we're at. And like I, I talk about this topic all the time in different contexts, so I'm never ashamed about bringing it up over and over again. But like if you look at the chart of the wealth gap, I mean you could look at it for the world, but especially here since the 1980s and you watch this V form, the thing that's correlated with that is our political differences forming in the middle of it at the same rate across from each other. And everything's just an iteration on top of each other. Well, there's no, you're right. There's no true beliefs. It's just, how do I get more money? Or how, how can mm. I, or how can mm. I get, or how can I not get less? There's no true beliefs. I mean, you know, you were in, you were in a, a industry that, you know, it's, 
How do I get more money? How do I get the one? How do I become part of the one percent and stay there? Right. And I saw a big mix of that. Yeah, and there's no care or concern for anybody else. There are there are people who absolutely, I'll say to an extent, yeah, take that into account. Yeah. There are other people in there who do the job and don't actively think about that, but they're not laughing about it in the elevator. Then there's the third kind of person who's laughing about it in the elevator. Right. And I did encounter some of those people. Sure. And you knew who they were. I'm glad I never worked for them. They were, they were the kind of people who, I mean, you want to talk about not having an open mind to anything. Their whole life was miserable because they looked at it as who's going to threaten the next bigger check I'm going to get. Forget Correct. the check I already have. Correct. Who's going to threaten the next bigger check? And to me, when I see all these regulations come in, which you know drove me nuts, drove me right the fuck out of there. Good thing, all in all. You know, I got out of where I didn't belong. To me, the people that then make those regulations, they have a huge argument behind making them because of the people like that. Because of the people – like. There's a guy, Jared Dillion, who was a great trader at Lehman Brothers, who after the financial crisis left banking behind. He was a great writer during his career. He would write yeah. a Bloomberg newsletter every morning on the terminal. And so he made that his full-time job. And then he's an investor, a very successful guy, wrote some great books. But he talks about – he has a great quote. I always amend it a little bit. But he says, there were approximately 20,000 people who worked at Lehman Brothers. 19,995 of them were generally good people who – by and large, we're good at their jobs. Mm -hmm. I always amend it and say 19,970. But the point is taken. The point is that you had a small select group of people who in that case, I'm talking about the financial crisis, made decisions that then trickled down the line to people who just have a job to execute. Right. Trusting what happens. I mean, you understand that, Chain of Command, trusting what happens above you. Just like some people, by the way, with like Stellar Wind and stuff. Who were just, you know, they're doing their job, right? And they're not thinking about it. Like, I don't blame all those people who saw it. Like, same thing here. And now you cause this whole crisis. You do all this shit. You're the fucking guy in the elevator. You're the guy talking shit against everyone else who's not you and your life that you already hate yourself. And then what happens? Everyone in Washington, D.C. creates rules for all of us. That make no fucking sense, by the way. Because what do they need? They need a head on a stick. And they need a symbol to say, we did something. It won't happen again. Until it does. And then they'll make more rules. Yeah. 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 I, I mean, you know my you know my feeling in the that world. So Yes, I do. And you were you were in the white collar world. Yeah. You saw I mean, one too many of those cases, I think. Yeah. I saw them all. You saw the, less the, from our line the line that I was in, I'll say, you definitely saw less from that and you saw more from the people who were touching the corporate side or like well, the ownership I think, side. I think I can throw it. You, you give me a dart board and give me anybody in that industry and let me throw a dart. I can fucking make a case on any one of them. That's scary, but maybe you're right. No know. issue. Not even an issue. The thing I got to ask you about though, that a lot of people- Because what's their value? Wait, we talked, you, we talked wait, value and impact, right? What do you mean? What's the value in that industry? What's the only thing that's of value? How much mm. you make? Period. I'll push back on that and say, and I understand the cynic in yeah, you there's not no being reason. in it. There well, there, are, there's no reason. There are some, I don't give a shit about my clients. I give a shit about how much money my client's going to make me. Period. There are some people who don't think that way. I'm not going to- How do they think? I knew, no, some people in there who genuinely give a shit. And- if they genuinely give a shit and they're good at their job, do they make a lot of money? Yes, they do. I can't get around that. That's anything. You're, you're valuable. I, mo I, I shouldn't say anything. It's a lot of things. If you're valuable in something, you make money. But I've seen people in what the middle. What about me? What do you mean? I'm valuable in something. Yeah, and now you've made money enough. after your career. But during your career at the make, government, you're not paid much. You're not going to make any money. Sure. But I don't do it for the money. Agreed. But they do. That's the difference. That actually, the, there's that no, there's no value. There's nothing bigger than themselves. It's themselves. They're the big. They can say the so and so wealth group is bigger than myself. Well, that's you. If they're at the head of it, right? 
so I think that's comes down full circle. It comes back to educating those people and trying to teach them what is important, mm. what really is impactful. And so, you know, you hear so many people that are Monday morning quarterbacking a lot of issues, right? So the perfect example that I have, I can remember, I can remember, a, a and it goes back to like a, a high level coaching organization that, um, in order to stay relevant, they have to raise money, right? So in order for a team, a club to stay relevant in a very competitive sport, right? Um, college wrestling, right? In order to do that, you have to raise money and you have the right within college wrestling to, with these regional training centers to actually raise money mm. and to bring people in bring in like what they call elite athletes, right? So they come in and, hey, they've wrestled, they're trying to make the world teams or Olympics. And I can remember there was a dude that just had tons of advice, tons of advice on the on the actual operations portion, um, like the technique and here's, here's how you should do this and whatever. And I can remember one of the greatest lines I think I've ever heard, and it goes back to, hey, I want to um, – you know, I think I can solve whatever issue. And, you know, I think I could solve the way um, we're, let's just take uh, the way we pulled out of Afghanistan, right? Okay. We, we can, here's, I, I have some ideas, right? And it was the same kind of thing. I think I can solve the way for your team to, to have more takedowns and matches late. Sure. And the coach just looked at him and said, really, um, I appreciate that, you know? <laughs> write a fucking check. And the guy looked at him and said, well, I don't really have a, a lot of money. You know, I don't have a lot of money. You just wrote a check that bought all brand new football helmets, home away and alternate for 150 men, men roster at the same university. And I looked at the bill and that was $495,000. Stroke a check. And don't ever fucking talk to me again about takedowns. So my point is, a lot of those folks, you know, if you want to become heard or impactful, put your money where that's the all they that's all they can do. Their opinions are only opinions that are valued by those in their organization, right? About what the latest piece here and piece there, and, and you know, listen, I, I, I think there's some great guys who have given back or have succeeded in the business. And, you know, most of those guys have overcome a lot of that, a lot of that good old boy, you know, laughing in the elevator shtick. But those who have not are guys that need to need to step up and be counted. And their value, where my value is in, you know, my, my ability to consult, my ability to kind of help and guide and mentor, their value is in write the mm. fucking check. You know, so that's kind of... That's part of what I see as no longer being part of the solution, but we continue as a country to all be part of the problem. Mm. You know, we're, we're worried about what the next administration is going to do. Who knows? It could be worse. Yeah. Hard to say, but each we've had one after another after another that has been worse than the one Hasn't before. been great. No. So, so that's my point. Like, when do we really think there's one without us really collaborating as a country, right, to put a better one in place? Do we really think that we have kind of solved that problem? Do we really think we have a true solution to the problem? And really, I, I honestly, I, I, if you go back and track it, I think one has been worse than the next. Hard to do, but you you might be. I'm now. I'm a I'm a big not George Bush liker, so I I'd probably go him. But yeah, like in general, the theme there. Yes, I I think you might be right. I think about we're. That I in think we ways. continue to get. I to be more to be fairer, we don't get any better. No, I like I'm I'm not a fan of anyone we've and and I can't even believe I say this sometimes. Yeah. Like I talk to my grandpa about this, yeah. who's like. Guy's never voted for a Democrat in his life. He's like a yeah. card-carrying Republican. And he was 
powerful in the corporate world in 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 the 90s at, at the height of his of his power and and he even can't believe that we say this but i've said this to him a few times and he doesn't disagree it's like minus a couple things that were political moves like the 94 crime bill which was not good which was a bipartisan thing in fairness to him but and then also the repealing glass steagall in 98 which was catastrophic started the financial crisis like on its way and then obviously the blowjob in in the oval office minus those things bill clinton i'll say at the same time very not good guy not someone i'd want my kid to emulate very effective president and in we had a lot of very good years with him when you look at every president since then there has been some sort of disaster at the very least yeah that occur i'm not just talking like a 9-11 or something i'm talking like yeah catastrophic political disaster that happens a theme that you can point to and yeah like you really open my eyes in the visual of yeah maybe it hasn't gotten progressively yeah i mean i think about it and i i think conservatively we can say it hasn't gotten any better no no so so i'm not going to say it's gotten worse each time but it surely hasn't been any type of change and improvement no right so i think that is something that we can all and, and this is like you know pipe dreams but you know it, it's something that really can we find that person or persons that can kind of bring this together i don't know i don't know i i just worry so much about the fact that the country the people, the rank and file of this country are are so distorted. Yes. And so far apart, like you said. And it's not just it's not just a it, it's not just a, a dollars and cents or, or status. It's more than that. You know, it's beliefs now. You know, it never I mean, listen, yeah, yeah, you know, fifties, sixties, yeah, beliefs were different, right? But um way different. But I, it's it's way worse now. Yeah, it, way worse now. Agreed. You know, way worse. I mean, um, and and I think we can examine that and and study that for the next twenty years and still not come up with the reason for why or why it was different in the fifties and sixties than it is now. But it's really the same problems. It's it's issues with race. It's issues with you know um, entitlement. It's mm-hmm. issued with issues with um, you know just self-serving agendas Mm -hmm. it's career politicians it's term limits it's the fundraising and the money it's campaign finance it's everything it's um you know a a stretched thin group of public servants i.e law enforcement military um you know all those things are year long years long studies to even figure out what the fuck went wrong and when um i just don't think you can blame it on any administration you know and look at it and say hey this is this is totally this or this is totally that and that's i'm not defending anyone but i just think it you know what trump was awful all right i'm not gonna but we voted against like i said we voted against trump we right. didn't vote for joe biden right. i mean if you if you hear the story behind the biden run it's, it's sad run. it's yeah. sad it's sad you know it's sad in that who who brought it to light for him like who who you know i mean shit you know my feelings on the on the bo biden you know you know promise me dad i mean fucking bullshit you know and 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 i i do want to say this too because like i didn't know him but Right, Bo, Bo Biden was such a. I did know a lot of people who knew him. Yeah, I know a lot of people who know Joe too. Previously, <laughs> you know, politically not a fan, but good people, right? And 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 Bo especially. I'm not going to speak for Hunter. I can't say the same. Yeah, I don't know what happened. But there, but you know. for Bo, he was. It's a tragic story that he died young, but servicemen, terrible, well liked, great guy, Smart down to dude. earth. And then I felt like it was such a manipulation of the fact that he's not here anymore to do that and i and i will say this as well it has never a great story it has never felt like to me joe biden wants this right never i i feel like i matt kemenosh said in here i borrow this line he said it beautifully well not beautifully but he said it perfectly he was like it's really sinister what they're doing to him i agree i couldn't agree more and you know that's that's exactly right they had to come up 
with the story of Bo Biden, which is a which is a powerful story. Yeah, you it's look, got truth somebody to dies it. and, yes. and um, that Joe never said. And you know, even if Joe would have said, "I said to I said to Bo, you're you're goddamn right. I've been waiting for this my whole life." Or something. It never happened. Like he just we got to get this guy out. It was all about getting this guy out before he did something crazy. And I don't, I can't honestly say I don't disagree with that. Yeah, that's the crazy part um, of it. It's it's scary, right? And at the same time, like I look at, I look at the whole. They're they're so much alike, but from different areas, right? Mm-hmm. Like the Trump family is as more dysfunctional than anyone, but the Biden family is right there. Right. I mean, listen. Here, here's the thing that bothers me more than anything. Bo dies an awful, you know, painful. I'm sure long lasting cancerous brain, brain cancer right? cancerous yeah. death. Right. It, it has to be horrific. Leaves behind a widow, beautiful widow. What happens? What happens? That's, Hunter Biden, yeah. right? So if nothing else, that's some Alabama shit to me. That's some Alabama shit. That's some fucking just. That's some biblical shit, bro. Right? Like, yeah. The the you know I I heard Biden or somebody quote something about the Bible. Like, well, you know, the brother is supposed uh, to take it. Well, you know what? The Bible also says we not should supposed fucking, to fuck him. Well, we, we, the Bible says we should stone fucking people. Won't do that anymore. That was just adulterous, so, you know. So, yeah. I, I, if 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 Joe Biden couldn't mm. find a way to lead that down a different path, how the hell can we expect him to straighten anything out? I want to say one thing, and then I want to. We there's two things we got to close yeah. on, and we're gonna get out of here yeah. soon. But I do want to say one thing to that. Otherwise, yeah. we'll go down this for hours. Yeah. You know what's so weird to me, and it's strictly by a coincidence of my geography. Is that in these last two elections we've had three candidates, right? We've yeah. had Hillary, Trump, yeah. and Biden. Yeah. I caddied at Wilmington Country Club for years. Used to caddy for Joe Biden's brother in law all the time. Never caddied for Joe. I never talked with Joe. Well, I don't fucking know Joe. Who's at all. that Doc Biden, the the Joe's brother? I'm actually not gonna say. But all right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And did stand near him and stuff. And one of the shocking things is that I, last time I stood close to him was summer 2014. Okay. Not that long ago. And I remember my thought was, holy shit. Isn't this guy like 71? He was, dude, he was yoked. Yeah. He was coming on the tee, like busting balls with everyone. Yeah. And yeah. everyone liked him, including most of the membership who didn't vote for him. They were not exactly Democrats, right? Everyone liked him. And I'm like, God damn, this guy, this motherfucker's a machine. Yeah. Then I see him give his first speech five years later. I'm like, how many brain aneurysms? Like 10? So that part's crazy to me. But with with Trump, you know, I was up in North Jersey. How many fucking people? I played at Trump Edminster with people. How many fucking people do I know who are, I know a few people who are like that with him, right? I knew people, I, I have distant family members who were in business with him for years. It's like I knew all the bad. I knew all the like, all right, there's less than what they say there. And then I heard some stories from Trump Mister that would give you a heart attack. Yeah. And then with Clinton, Chappaqua, New York, got family that lives up there. Got a lot of people that are like close to that. And there was a weird dynamic here. And so there was a little bit of a human side with all three of these people that I couldn't put aside. What I will say is that I never heard a good story about Hillary. She was the one person. Like I heard a lot of good stories about Biden. I heard a lot of good stories about Trump. I also heard negative political stories in the sense that people who would tell the same good stories would be like for trump they'd be like but he's a jerk off right he has no idea what he's right. doing and right. then for biden they'd be like but he's kind of an idiot yeah but you know what i mean yeah. so it was never like hey good ending for them to be president but there's like a human side to it right with, with clinton it was like no she's kind of evil so take that for what you want yeah. but i don't think any of those three people should have been in that position it is just very very weird to me like sitting in the seat where there's like a little bit of a connection to all of it. Yep. And yet we're at this point in the country where these are the figures that on purpose or not on purpose have led to the symbolic division of everything. And then I guess you got to throw like Obama and Bush in there too. Yeah. But like in the recent years, these are the people that the fights have been over. Uh, totally. And yet at the yep. end of the day, 
they're just dumbasses playing at country clubs. Like that that's how I see you know you understand what I'm saying? Like how weird that is. Yep. And then it is. like you're in government. You were around these people. I can't even imagine how you like the incompetency that you know of at certain levels that no, like we weird. would all have a heart attack over. It's weird. It's weird. It's weird. Well, the the last two things are actually yep. they're they're to the viewers who are a huge fan of yours and, and the listeners. Yes. And it's some stuff we we discussed last episode. And as I've said on these or the last time you were in here, I should say. As I've said on these, I'm careful about, you know, not touching you're already very open about stuff. I don't wanna overstep and, and stuff you don't want to touch. So the first thing was the September fifteenth, two thousand one story. Yeah. Which also went a little viral on TikTok, where that was something we had talked about not in detail off yeah. camera like maybe a few weeks before and so when you were telling it and you kind of stopped it i didn't push on purpose because i was like oh maybe there's some details there or whatever but i talked to you on camera before tonight what i wanted to clear up was if we can go into details the whole concept there were a lot of people guessing that this was the quote-unquote dancing israelis and my understanding was that the the "Quote unquote dancing Israelis were the people in the white van who you made." Yeah, that was the North Jersey piece right. that we're filming. You made a quick mention yeah. of that. What was they were that? filming? They were filming. They had cameras set up to um, to film prior to the the planes crash, and they were Israelis. You know, I I believe so. I just can't. I I, I was racking my brain for it. Um, I think that's right, though. And so the conspiracy theory that people were putting on that, was that they, they oh the Israelis were, knew were waiting, they were yeah. waiting for it to happen, and that and that's not the only story that had come out of that. Um, there were similar stories, and there's actually, if I remember, I remember viewing a video of it being set up before, like viewing a video from. The tower is like all focused in and then the planes hit. So when you see something like that, and I want to clarify too. Yeah. Right away, just like as a high level basic intelligence measure, when I see people try to tell me those weren't planes that go into the building, I, I literally want to jump off a building myself. Yeah, I, I would like to that's, myself. That's insane. Oh, God. But for the people that are like, oh, we knew it was coming, or someone knew it was coming. When you hear something like that, it's like, what the fuck? Like- I. Listen, I, I was convinced, and, and there's a couple things, you know, that strike me. Um, but those are Israelis. Those are supposed to be our well, allies. Well, the, the one I was talking about was was that white van, right, piece. That's separate from the other videos that I viewed. That's not the dancing Israelis. No, no. Okay. I, I never, we just knew they had set up because they had equipment and they were in the spot to be where they were supposed to, where they could have had access to, but sure. we... I've never now. Maybe there's videos of within that, but I never saw that. Okay. But I did view videos of set up closer, and, and I don't for the hell for the life of me, I don't know who those folks were. I just don't remember. Okay. All right. So I I don't want to pick at that because that that wasn't yeah. your purview. The thing yeah. I do want to pick at is the story you told. So very quick recounting. Yeah. It was the fifteenth, the Saturday night after we get information from the employer which was the local food mart I, I can't remember if it's an acme or a or a um or shop right or, or what it was but it's kind of at the turn everybody knows where if you're familiar with seaside heights ortley beach that area it, there's a there's kind of a where 35 makes a turn coming out of ortley going into seaside heights and around that turn if you kind of go down 37, there's the dock on the right, and you go over the bridge, you can see um, Seaside Heights rides and all that stuff. There's a food store mm. that stretches that entire length. Very popular. I mean, that's everybody goes to the food store if you're a renter in Portly that and that stuff. So yeah, I know where we, that is. we get a lead in on that um, Saturday morning, the 15th. And, and remember, the leads were popping like it was – I think we were – at one point, I think we were taking, you know – 1100 leads a day how do you ca like how do you judge those and so you put so, so there's five desks we call you know we separate the desks via county okay and each of those desks is manned for eight hours at a time 24 7 by you know hire some intel guys some u.s attorney people and they they route through them and they just prioritize 
So now they're assigning them. I was a team leader, so they're assigning me, you know, everything in Ocean and Monmouth County. Okay. Right? And then we would get anything that was evidence collection, my team would get too. And it could so be that's kind of what could be thousands, you know. So you were working, I mean, you, but you, you could get a lead that went fifteen hours. How many people so, were on your team at that time? I think I had eleven. All right, well, that's then, actually like impressive, given yeah. how many teams there had to be. Yeah, at eleven, I had eleven FBI agents, and I think we had five or six task force guys. So they were county prosecutors office guys. So we had Monmouth and Ocean County guys. Wow. That's more than I would have so, expected. Yeah, so like 15, 16 guys. So we get we get this lead early Saturday morning, and the lead basically says, look, these this group of guys, and, and they were Egyptians. They were Egyptians, okay. right? Which even there freakier. Was, there was one Egyptian hijacker, I think, yeah, right? right. So there was seven employees of this food store, all... So we get, you know, hey, look, I don't know if it's anything. This is the way the call comes in. Um, and I talk to the guy. I'm not sure if it's anything, man, but I, I I can't, you know, it's four days after this thing. I'm still a mess. Um, these guys never missed a paycheck. So every single week for four years, I think it was more than four years. I think they started working there in 2005. They never missed a check. Um, they missed a check this week. This is where it gets scary, right? So this was planned for so. So, long. so you're you're gonna love this. So, um, we go. You know, we 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 take. I think it took three guys and said the other eight. We were on. Hey, be stand by. We had another another job. We had video of um. We had video of the hijackers at a wedding like the week or two before. So they were going to collect that uh, in Jersey, of course. And so, um, we go in. You know, there's the paychecks. There's the names, and it's the same address. And it's a street in Seaside Heights. Small apartment. So we do all our site survey, do what we got to do. We, we we get visual on it. Um, there's two brand new cars parked in the driveway. Um, no tags, just cars brand new, with still with the um, window sticker on both of them. So immediately I'm like, you know, this is, this is bad, you know, whatever. So we do our airport checks, uh, run the names. Um, they're like, yeah, these guys, these guys got tickets, but we halted everything down, so had tickets to fly back. Uh, the, the, the Thursday. So what was that? The thirteenth, thirteenth. They had tickets to fly tickets fly back. back to Alexandria through Alexandria back to wherever they were going. Any we didn't have a right. So they're student. They're on student visas for five years, six years. How's that so, even possible? Well, there, there's another guy that was arrested. That I can't. I don't feel comfortable mentioning okay. his All name, right. right. yeah. but he was arrested for basically five five k a pop. He'd get you in the country and keep you here with a student visa. Separate apartments, separate and just arrest. keep it crazy, right? Okay. But whatever. So anyway, we get it. We do all our back. We I get my evidence response team ready to rock and roll. Um, I didn't feel like I needed SWAT uh, or special operations. I felt more than comfortable because of what I did in the past. They were scheduled to go out on the thirteenth, though. Right, but why but every, didn't they? Everything shut down. Oh right, duh. Everything shut down. My so bad. I'm like, okay, we got a little bit of time, but I want to go. So we we go in. Um, we surveil the the shop right or whatever. We had two guys on that. I had, let's see, me, me, hey Quinn. I think it was six of us that went to the apartment. Uh, three were out surveilling, and I had the other three guys. Uh, I forget if they were just on top of the street. Whatever. Full, full gear on. Um, we did not have gear on. We didn't have any identifiers. Um, I made that call because I was just like. Just I was just suits. like, hey, I just don't want to mess around, you know, with um, anybody seeing in case, in case there's nothing going on or whatever. But you can know, you I just imagine? Knew. Can you imagine like people who can see the smoke from the buildings rising up from oh, yeah. Ground Zero well, well, get, in their neighborhood, seeing like a bunch of FBI jackets out there? But, well, that was the issue. You know, we didn't want to get shot at. We didn't want to get, you know, have locals. You really don't want locals to know, right? You right. don't want locals to know anything that's going on because who the fuck knows? You don't know if these guys in five years, it could have been tight with the dudes, whatever. So, like I said before, knock on the door. And, um, you know, what before happened? they even answered my, the parent, I was like, we got a problem, you know? So we went, we went and did what we had to do. We got them, um, got them on the ground. And, uh, the TV is just playing a loop of the planes crashing into the tower. So we start to talk. They're belligerent as shit, you know. I think. How yeah, did you get it was through the four door? Four in. How did but, you you knock it down? Yeah, yeah. So they um, didn't open it up. No, they well they opened a little bit, but we knocked it oh. down. 
So four of them are in there. Two came home. My two guys at the top of the street grabbed those two coming in, thank God. So we find the first thing we find, and, and remember, you know, the box cutters were the thing that yes. wind up slicing the flight attendants next, right? So we open the first drawer. There's 20 box cutters laying in there. So right out of the box, you're like, eesh. So now we, they're all secured. We got them cuffed and they're, they're fucking talking shit and everything else that goes on. And we start to, you know, we basically call in, we need a search warrant. Search warrants were being issued like at the drop of a hat, you know, basically it took, took us about 45 minutes to get a judge to sign off. You know, we, we gave them everything. We took pictures, we sent pictures. We did, we did backgrounds on these guys quickly to find out the whole deal with being on student visas for five and a half years, flight out the day after, two days after 9-11, right? The whole deal mm -hmm. and um, get the search warrant. We're not really, we're seeing stuff. Um, you know, we're, we're kind of seeing like a ton of different, clothing and different shit like brand new shit so we turn around and we um we get the search warrant we start the search warrant and in the course of small apartment i mean i'm trying to think there's one bedroom in six the back guys live there? six six guys one bedroom in the, you walked in there's a the stove and the refrigerator on the left there was a big living room in front i could still i could still see it little hallway uh two bedrooms one on each side bathroom right in the middle so we start it's it's pack ratted out in the bathrooms, right? Uh, in the bedrooms, we start looking. It's just all brand new clothing from Eddie Bauer, in tons of different sizes. What does that tell you? Immediately, it's a it's a supply cell for people coming into the country. The two brand new cars out there were ready to fit in, you know, to the community, and we find backpacks stuffed with American dollars. I counted one backpack. It was. Almost one hundred fifty thousand dollars. And they, these guys are they, working at a supermarket. Yeah, making making three eleven a week. And they were students. Each. No. What happened to them? So we, you know, start the process, and we 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 get arrest warrants, and we make arrest warrants, and uh, we arrest them. And um, there's threats going on. They're threatening. One dude was scary. He's a scary motherfucker. Um, it's a big dude, and uh, he just he wanted to. He's like, hey, as soon as I can get out of this shit, I'm going to kill somebody. So we're like, well, you ain't getting out. You know, thanks for saying that. We appreciate it. It helps. And so we, that was, we, Is he saying there was that no, in English? Uh, he was saying, yeah, it was broken English, but you can clearly understand. Okay. They were there long enough to know the deal. So to understand the language and everything else. So in, in running, in running everything, it led us to the, the guy who brought, they, one of them cooperated. Gave us the guy who brought them in, which led us to other arrests around the country, which really was the start of Gitmo. We brought those guys to they went Miami to first, and then we brought them to Gitmo. And I did, I did probably two and a half weeks of interrogations down there at so. Guantanamo. Yeah, and they're still there. So that's going to be a next time story. We don't have time for that. Holy so shit. yeah, okay. long story short is um, they're still there. They're still there. Those yeah. guys. Yeah. That you arrested. Yes, absolutely. So they've been there for 20. There's only like 19 out. guys left there. No, there's more, but they'll, they'll commute. Um, they'll tell you there's, there's not as many, but there's more than that. Holy shit. A lot to pick there. Yeah. All right. I can't touch that. Yeah. We're, we're so, gonna have to do and I don't time. know how much I, I'm, I'll get feedback from somebody. I'll, yeah. I'll get a phone call this okay. week or when it's released. You may never um, that's that fine. People, that's fine. But, um, ultimately I feel comfortable in telling that portion of the story cause it's scary shit. And that was, you know, that was a Did great you? pickup by a true American, um, at that, at that food store. Like that was a, that was most people would not, we were getting shit that was like, um, that was just a great pickup. We were getting we we weren't getting anything close to something that good. The guy who put that in, did he say he had had a weird feeling for a long time? No, no, nope. It's just they were recent. they were reliable, um, extremely respectful, timely. That where they went bad was thinking Too they perfect. were getting out of country. Too perfect. Yeah, and they had plenty of cash. They had everything that they wanted to do. Um, you know, my, my thought. The other guys weren't to, like that though. To this day, no, no, they were part. Muhammad of, Atta was these a, dudes was were party animals. They, they were party animals. These guys too. We found out later through interrogation work. But yeah, they're um, real. They're real. You know what? They're selectively extremists. So, so they were. There was a whole routine 
they would fly back just to clear, and then they would bring in them, half of them back with another three guys or four guys or ten guys, however, and they would be available for additional attacks to supply. To and provide then it supplies didn't happen because to guys, Americanize them, yeah, because we you, you guys know, just cracked down. Yeah, and I mean there was nothing going to happen because the the world shut down. They th- they thought, you know, they're they're not the smartest dudes in the world. So they figured, all right, we'll do this, and then we'll just continue to blast west, go through Chicago. But you ain't doing shit, you know. So, um, but but I worry. I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. I worry about this shit coming back. We've let down. Look at the borders. We've let down our. We've let our guard down. And we've got at least a weak appearing administration. You know, we, we do. It's weak appearing. I don't know anything about what they're doing or policies. I haven't seen much. I haven't read much. I've tried to stay away from the news. But ultimately, I think we've got an issue. You know, I think we've got an issue with at least the appearance, the way the world views this country. I don't like that. Again, um, I'm not going to – we're going to have to talk about that next yeah, time. Yeah, we will. I'm not, not going to touch that because we we'll will. go all day. Yeah. The last thing that's got to be touched, though, and then we're done – was the the plane in November 2001 because we started to talk about it. We started to it, talk about and that. And then you got into something important with that that had to do with like being the guy, being in charge of- The morgue. Yeah. Yeah. Which was but, crazy. Yeah. So appreciate you going into that. But yeah. the, the idea here was that in November 2001, after the September 11th attacks yes. had happened- I think it was there, like right around, right around Veterans Day. So the, in in November, yep. there was a plane that crashed in Brooklyn on takeoff. On takeoff, yeah. and it was not it's a big plane. Seven, it, six, it was a seven six seven, I believe. It blew up. It, yeah. The fit. Well, the official the official word on it that was reported was that it hit. The plane that took off before it was a large 747 or, yeah, it had to be a 747. There was no, there was no uh, Airbus like 330 or anything, but, but a huge 747. And its wake, supposedly the plane that crashed took off too close in proximity to the plane in front. And the wake, now, now let's, let's be honest. Like, have you ever Airbus. seen, right, have you ever seen ever any air traffic control let well, let's let them both in, except if you're the fucking blue angels mm. <laughs> you don't you know it's 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 whatever it is i don't know what the amount of time but there's a standard at least a couple of minutes i mean shit we all sit on runways and we wait right um for the so supposedly yeah that that wake of those engines off the 747 dislodged the tail wing of this seven six seven, or I think it was a, I think it was a seven six seven. It's a big plane. That's a huge. That's like the double decker. Correct. Well, no, it, no, it's 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 like the, it's, I can tell you because it, it's there was there was no pods back in those days on these things. Well, but, Air Force One but, was a seven fifty seven, right? Uh, no, it's bigger. It's seven forty seven. Is that bigger? Yeah. I thought seven thirty seven is the lowest. It is, but then seven it goes seven thirty seven, seven forty seven is next biggest, and then fifty seven smaller but bigger than thirty seven. Sixty seven. Oh, is, I didn't know is, that. Okay. Sixty seven has the two two four two. That's Air Force One. No, Air Force One is even bigger. It's bigger than that. Okay, it's huge. All right. It's its own thing. Um, but um, so this plane crashes yeah, off the runway so, so in it, Brooklyn. It it loses at JFK. It was LaGuardia. So the Bronx, I guess. I can't is that, remember. Is that where I LaGuardia can't remember. is? It, look, can you look it up real quick? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I want to say, I want to say it's, no, I want to say it's, it's closer, to, it's, it's LaGuardia. American Airlines Flight 587, I'm just going to put it behind us, switch the source real quick. Uh, this was November 12th, yeah. 2001. Yeah, yeah. It was, I said, I Day. said the flight. So it was American Airlines flight 587, regularly scheduled international flight from John F. Kennedy Airport. To Dominican? To Santa Domingo, yep. Dominican yep. Republic. Yep. On November 12, 2001, the Airbus was flying the route, crashed into the neighborhood of Bell Harbor, Rockaway, Peninsula of Queens. So very close to Brooklyn. I see what you're saying. So it got off the ground and then And right plummeted. Away. So okay. it's in, the, in the cause, the cause was the tail wing fell off. Due to the wake, 
Now, you know, come on. You know Is this I mean? case closed? Come on. Yeah. It's closed. How fast? Ah, that's a good question. As long as it took, you know, the FAA to, or the, what is it? What's what's the um, federal emergency, whatever the hell it is? Uh, the flight, is it, it's not. Whatever it is. I know. F- FSTB or something. Something like that. Yeah. yeah. So as long as it took them to get the black box and do it. But the, the tragedy was that it, it killed a bunch of people on the ground. It killed a bunch of people in the neighborhoods, like a lot of I shit, never like heard, flying debris. When I was and, young, I never heard of No, this it was not publicized. I mean, I'm telling you, it was uh, November 11th is Veterans Day. I remember it because I was scheduled to go. I was actually scheduled to take my first day off on the 11th, and I got called in to do evidence. I had to bring evidence via Blackhawk down to uh, our crime lab in Quantico. Mm. Came back late, got to bed late, and I get a fucking call at 3 o'clock or 4, whatever time it was. Six o'clock in the morning, seven o'clock in the morning, we just had another plane go down. So I'm thinking, oh my God. Another one. And it was. And there's no doubt in my mind. You know, somebody loosened up that tail. You know? Oh, had to so be. How someone, the hell else can it doesn't fall off? It doesn't fall off. Who knows? Do you think that could have been like a Who copycat knows? asshole? I don't know. But they kind of covered that up. No, yeah, well, I never got I did the morgue. I did all the So you weren't on the case, you were doing I did the all the terrible, like, you know I think we talked about it last time. Most people die from broken necks. Yeah. Body's intact. So picture I'm Really? Yeah. On a plane crash? You're doing you know, I mean shit, the thing the thing got up off the ground and came right back down. So on impact, think about you drive two hundred and fifty miles an hour right now into a tree. And there were no survivors, right? No. Yeah. No. No. Terrible carnage. Awful. So, you know, there's we're we're trying to get back to normal in airports, right? And that happens. That could have been a coordinated kind of thing. And actually, I, I don't even A million wanna, percent. I don't it was somebody that survived. That is that is a cell that survived the fucking after. That's lazy, lazy police work. See, that's the shit that makes people not trust governments, though, because... and I. That's under, my opinion. I don't know that. Yeah, yeah. I, I understand. But I know, I know my guys didn't have a chance to do anything else. I can guarantee you that. No one got on it. In my and, fucking territory. And, and that th- doesn't help anybody else, but... There's also a part of me that says... And people are going to yell at me for saying this, but there's a part of me that says I actually get that one because someone fucked up and the nation was on such a high alert. This, I, I mean, I guess it killed people on the ground. That's horrible. Oh, it was, it, it, I don't know what it said. I mean, the article, but it killed some people in their apartment, in their beds, burnt down houses and shit. I can understand if the government had already, people were still in a panic, but I can understand if the government was like, holy fucking shit. We can't have. Could be. I mean, I think that's a bad precedent. Don't get me wrong. I think that's the wrong decision. But you know that there was going to be panic on that. Massive panic. Agreed. So they, how many people died? It was a lot of people. 251. There were, yeah, no, there were 260 occupants, 260 died. Yeah. And then ground injuries, five fatalities. Yeah, it was a young kid from, it's like a high school kid uh, in his bed. Christ. Because I did his recovery too. Oh. All right, so you don't know a fuck ton about that beyond that? I mean, I kind of would, you know, remember, we were still on, we, we were 100% on. on 9-11. Uh, yeah, yeah, on Pen Pump. So we weren't, I mean, that was a that was a 100% evidence recovery. So we, I just got tasked out because I had experience in morgue overseas. So I just. And I was like, you know, we're like, you're going there. And I remember I was, I got back on the Blackhawk after midnight mm. and went to bed. And then I was like, what the hell? That's my phone. And we were leaving, you know, we, we were leaving two, three phones on because if you needed something, you needed to go. We, we were the lead, we were the lead FBI office in New Jersey because New York was shut down. They weren't open because they couldn't take a chance. So we set up everything, you know, Fresh Kills in Staten Island was the was They the were in that 26th Street garage or whatever. Yeah. They just made a documentary on that. I haven't seen yeah, it. Yeah. But yeah. That's crazy. So I mean, we um we we took we had the ticket on that. Our office. Damn. Well, Jim, that was 6 hours, man. That's two episodes right there. Not all. It's going to work out well. Not but this all. was I'm tired. this was I think this 
I always hesitate to say this because I do enjoy all of them. I think this was probably my favorite we ever did. We covered a lot. We covered a lot. This was a great. This was this was a great curtain call, coming back out for people because people appreciated this whole thing. But thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Really appreciate it. Enjoyed it. And I I know everyone out there is going to appreciate it too. But it's pretty awesome to have someone who has been to where you've been, who's willing to completely unabashedly share the opinions whether people like them or not and i i appreciate the hell out of that hey i i enjoy doing it i hope it helps some people it will it will jim thank thanks, you man brother. thanks bro all right and thank you for the suds by the way little, little plug for jim's jim's second little hobby here after his after his career the the jersey mics brought some fire subs down there too i'm gonna go attack some more but come by our location in sicklerville hilarious Route 42 South, Still Black Horse Pike. Still the thing you've ever done. And um, we're also opening a new standby for 2022 opening of our second store and our third store. Amazing. And, and your we'll son's you know killing it. I said this last time. He's like killing I it. I said it again. Your son's, your yeah. son's running the operations here, let's be honest. He's a savage. Yeah, he's a savage. Takes care of, takes after his uh, his father. He does. He does. All right. Well, thank you, Jim. We'll do it thank again. Thank you, sir. Yeah, I'm looking and forward to it. This, this was fun. Everyone else, you know what it is. Give it a thought. Get back. Peace.